Bob? Nope, there we go. Oh, what about Boone or Bob? Bob is, Bob is on the line for Boone today. Huh, I'm not seeing, oh, there he is. Hi, Bob. Great. All right, we are live streaming. Uh, good afternoon to our audience and our work group members. Uh, we are just starting our beaver management work group um, this Wednesday, October 27th. This is a three hour meeting today, uh, goes from two till five o'clock. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Couple of Zoom meeting tips. These slides will all look familiar to all of you. Uh, we ask that you stay muted. Uh, we ask that you turn your video on if you can, so it feels like we're in the same space. That would be great. And of course, contact Sam if you have any technical difficulties. We'll go to the next slide. There we are. Um, just a reminder of where you find your controls. Uh, if, it's helpful if you can raise your hand using the raise hand icon. If not, we'll just watch for a hand raised and uh, we can do it both ways. Um, I think everybody's everybody has their name on the screen, uh, except for Colin. Is that Greg who's just called in? Yes, it is. Great, welcome, glad you could join us by phone. Okay, glad to be here. Well, go ahead and go to the next slide. So our agenda today, um, we, we, as we talked at the last, the last meeting, we teed up this conversation with Brian and Brett, uh, really focusing in on management options um, that they have been using and found successful on um, forest service lands in similar environments to Oregon. Um, we want to really start getting into figuring out what the suite of management options looks like that could form the basis for the recommendations for this group. And uh, Brian and Brett are going to walk through case studies um, with us about that. And then we'll take a short break. And then we got some feedback on that. We originally had two presentations scheduled and we got some feedback from folks that um, people really liked the small group conversations that we had the last time. And we're feeling like we really need to start getting into conversations about what uh, recommendations might begin to look like. And so we have we took the other presentation off um, and we, may, we could bring it back at another time if folks feel like that that would be helpful when, when we identify additional information needs. Um, but for today, we thought we would take advantage of the longer meeting to have the small group discussion time to begin to outline, not really outline, just to identify what are recommendations that people are thinking about um, and start getting those out on the table. And so you'll see we've got um, some time for small group discussion. You'll be uh, randomly assigned to groups of three and we'll get into more detail about what that looks like when we get closer. And then we'll come back to a large group discussion for our viewing audience, just like when we did the last small group breakouts, only one small group will be uh, live streamed and the others won't, but we'll have the full group come back and report out the things that they talked about. So that way everybody in our audience can see and the work group can see all the things that everybody um, talked about in the small groups. Um, so and then we'll confirm next steps, uh, meeting topics and uh, our next meeting. So that's our agenda for today. Any hot questions or clarifications needed before before we move on. Okay, let's go ahead. So um, the first agenda item we have, of course, is our welcome agenda review, those kinds of things. And we have our ground rules, which I'll just give you a minute to take a look at. The same ground rules we've been using all along for our uh, conversations. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Sam. So this is something new. Um, it looks might look a little bit familiar because if you remember quite a few meetings ago, we put out a schematic of what we thought it would take um, for the meetings moving forward. And so I'm just introducing this to you now and I'm gonna bring it back at the end of the meeting. 
And the reason why I want to introduce it is for two things. One is to remind everybody of the, of the conversations that we've had up to this point. So you can see um, along the left side, all the a summer, a, you know, a title basically of the meeting topics that we've had to date. Um, so our charter mission and scope, um, current management from ODFW's perspective, current management from our eight federal agencies perspective, learning more about uh, beaver modified habitat, habitat, pros, cons, and metrics, and the value and the value statement that the group came up with. Um, we had conversation about uh, population limiting factors and range and the range of management options where we heard some more from ODFW about the kinds of things that they can be doing more of, less of, or differently. Um, and then uh, at our last meeting, we took a deep dive with Jimmy and Michael around beaver biology and beaver ecology um, to really make sure we've, we're, we have got a solid foundation there. And then today, of course, we're going to be taking what we learned and starting to um, under hear some case studies and uh, management options so that we can decide what management options we might want to consider uh, here in Oregon for this group. And so that's what we've that's what we've done and where we are. And then you'll see we, we start to move into emerging recommendations and we've got uh, several meetings focused on recommendations. And I'm proposing that in large part because it's going to take I think it's going to take a bit for this group to really be able to talk through and weigh uh, pros and cons and trade-offs around different recommendations. Um, and so we've got several meetings outlined for that. Of course, if there are information needs that people have identified, we can add um, you know, that in for our next meeting. Um, and then you'll also see the other new thing is when we were working with ODFW commission and staff Kind of working backwards from a potential commission presentation, we had all had in our mind that that would happen in the January, February timeframe. And the reality is, is in order to get a presentation put together for ODFW commission and get it on their calendar um, and working backwards from that in terms of when our recommendations would need to be done and when materials would need to be made available uh, for the public and for the commission, that really puts our, that commission meeting in March. And, and so we're working with Michelle and the ODFW um, commission around um, getting that meeting scheduled or, or getting this topic on that agenda actually. And so that would mean if you can look at the bottom of this screen here that um, the recommendations materials need to get to them in February, which, and so we've, I've put two spots in January for two additional Beaver work group meetings for us to hone in and fine tune the recommendations. And so we, we want to, we've talked with ODFW commission staff about this um, and with the commissioners about this. Um, we shared a similar schematic with the trap check group yesterday that's specific to their group and where they are. They're on a similar time frame um, as the Beaver work group. So, and then the other thing I want to draw your attention to is you know, we have this subgroup in this uh, for Beaver group and we put little blue stars that shows where the subgroup has met. And then a question for all of you today towards the end of the meeting is the role of the subgroup moving forward. Um, so I think that we can all agree that it will be difficult to actually write recommendations with a, a large group like this. Um, and so, you know, do we have a small group do that? Do we do that in small groups in the meeting? Does Sam and I do that? So that's some of the questions we have for you to consider in the small group discussion today. So I didn't think we would spend time talking about this at this point in the agenda, but I wanted to put it out there so that you had it in mind as you're listening to um, the presentation moving forward. And, uh, and also to know that we're gonna circle back to it um, towards the end of the meeting. And I wanted you to have this in mind also for the small group discussions for today. So I'm gonna pause, even though I've just said, we're not gonna talk about it right now. Um, and just see if there are any burning questions or clarifications before we move on. Jimmy, and then Stan. Hi, thanks, Jimmy. Just really quick, uh, just a point of clarification for me. Once the final draft is ready to submit, is that submitted to ODFNW staff or is that submitted to the commissioners? That's a good clarification. We actually talked with ODFW staff about this and 
um, Kevin, um, I'll look for you to clarify what we talked about. But my understanding is, is that um, we would be, we, meaning it, it could be Sam and I together with work group members and, and um, ODFW staff, or it could be just Sam and I together with work group, some work group members presenting it directly to the ODFW commission. And then the commission would consider the recommendations and then provide direction to staff about what, you know, to follow up on or what are next steps. Kevin, did I get that right? Yeah, as part of the, the kind of contractual agreement and what we had outlined as a process is what Jamie said, that that report recommendations, how it gets relayed to the commission is just as she said, then the commission as a body has to, you know, kind of vote to determine as, a, as that body uh, what the directions are to staff. Uh, so those recommendations are not rulemaking process. So the commission then would direct us to undertake some uh, uh, rulemaking process in light of the recommendations that they tell direct us to go forward on. And so that that's kind of that process. So at that point, uh, Jimmy, I think, you know, the staff is aware and participating in, in the process here. And then with that, the staff gets the directions on which recommendations go forward as uh, potential and proposed rulemaking. Okay, thanks very much. Stan, you had your hand up. So on the limiting factor portion of it, um, I just wanna ask if, you know, when I refer back to the petition, the petition was very specific in its request of the commission. And that was to ban harvest on federally managed lands. And I'm not sure that from our perspective that the limiting factors have been really properly identified and explored to their fullest because the petition had one limiting factor that they wanted to control. So I just wanna bring that up, keep that on everybody's mind that the other limiting factors, I'm not sure have been really explored and I'm not sure we've quantified the impact of uh, regulated harvest either. Thanks for that, Stan. And that's that's it's helpful to be thinking about information like that, Stan. That when we, that's one of the reasons why I put out this schematic in advance. And so for everybody to be thinking about, you know, what is it? What is more information or deeper conversation that we need to have that will help to inform recommendations? And you know, we and and so talk about that in your small groups today as well. So um, identify those. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Any other burning questions before we move on to our presentation? Okay. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and go to our next slide, which I think introduces our presentation. So we have Brian and Brett. Um, they are gonna share their screens for the presentation and uh, Let's go ahead and get started. I don't know which Please one of you we'll, we'll Try to share our screens. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to ask the question here in a second. So can you see my full screen or my notes yeah. screen? We see your full screen and you sound good. Okay, I'm going to get rid of your faces so I can look at this thing. So, uh, again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brett Roper. I'm a forest service fish biologist. I'm out of the WO, but I, I'm in Logan. And so I'm going to do the first part of this presentation. Uh, Brian Staub will do the middle part, uh, and then I'll finish off. And, and again, I like some of the discussion that Jamie had at the beginning. You know, I, 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 I watch both Jimmy and Michael's presentation from the, the from the last meeting. So I tried not to spend too much time on that area. I, I did try to bring in a little bit of this limiting factors toward the end. And, and so this, this presentation at least is gonna be geared toward the how trapping closures might affect stream dynamics on the public lands uh, in Oregon. And again, that's primarily because Jimmy did a really good job of covering sort of basic biology uh, Michael did a pretty good job of explaining what the impacts were. And so I'm trying to, Michael, or sorry, Brian and I are trying to take this and, uh, and, and talk about public lands in Oregon. And to do that, I'm going to talk about stream habitat. 
how the habitat changes a little bit, a little bit differently than, than what Michael did, sort of a, a larger scale context. It's going to be a few examples and then try to put this public lands uh, in context. I mean, right now, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's focusing on, on changing harvest regulations for beaver on public land. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Hey, Brett. And yes. just before you move on to your next slide, do you, do you want folks to ask you questions as you go along or would you rather them wait um, till you and Brian are done with your presentation? I'm always better at being interrupted as I go. I, you know, so, but the hard part is sometimes it's really difficult for me to, to know that there's a question in this format. So if one comes up, if you just let me yeah. know, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so I'll track that. And if it looks like we're getting bogged down with too many questions and you're having a hard time finishing your presentation, you know, we'll just play that by ear. Um, so I'll watch for questions and, um, and give you a heads up, give you and Brian a heads up. I would greatly appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> So, so anyway, you know, the, uh, this lesson from landscape, and so I'm trying to give some sort of idea of the past. Uh, and it's pretty interesting, you know, because I've been dealing with beaver for a while. There's some of the people that are, are, are on this presentation that have been doing it longer than I. And I think one of the things that we can look at is sort of this classification system. If you look at Rosgen, there's almost, uh, when it was originally out in the early 90s, there's no discussion uh, of of beaver or even really wood in it. Uh, most of that's just hydrology uh, and, and slope. Uh, there is sediment, but they don't really talk about wood. Montgomery and Buffington brings in this sort of large wood concept to, to the stream classification, forest pool morphology. And more recently you get to this Castro and Thorn. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. I will, and then, and then Brian will again later. And when I did my PhD, which I did in Oregon on the Umpqua, you know, I, it was primarily focused on large wood, right? We're in these big forested system and, and, and we really focused on, on large wood changing streams. Uh, but, but one of the things we're learning is where there isn't large wood, there's small wood and, 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 and willow and aspen and beavers sort of dominate uh, systems on these small, small uh, wood systems. So this is this Castro and, and Thorn basic. And so most of the past sort of classification systems sort of looked at hydrology and geology. I think there's a gained importance of biology of, of which beavers can play an important role. Part of this same publication has these two triangles uh, where sort of the, the, the top of this functioning is in the narrow part of the, the, the triangle. And what you can see is these, and this is what I was focused on in my PhD on the Umpqua was these channels spanning large wood systems and, and the, the loss of wood due, due to, to stream cleaning and, and roads. And, and the interesting part is over the last couple of decades, we've really come to sort of better understand the importance of these, the same process, but in, in areas where the wood's smaller, and again, I'm gonna come back to that several times where we have these beaver meadows, uh, beaver dam complexes, and, and, and yeah, that basically we can start to lose that as, as well. And again, a lot of the discussion you all have been having is how much have we lost, uh, how much of that's on, on public lands. And, and it's important, Ellen Wool does a really good job of sort of describing these as two different sort of systems, one sort of a, conifer forest, one's a, a, a more open meadowy area. But it's important to recognize that these really aren't mutually exclusive landscapes. Uh, you know, within conifer forest types, there'll always be floodplains that support beavers and their dams. And again, I do think those are, are sort of unique situations. As you can see, there's, I've got beaver ponds from this sort of classic meadow to, to some, you know, sort of, uh, sort of conifer starting to show up in the middle and then a uh, conifer forest on the bottom. And so what, while beaver favor willow and aspen, yeah, I've seen beaver ponds made of everything from cedar to sagebrush, depending upon where you are. And so you know, that sort of limiting factor analysis, if we focus just on one type of habitat, we may end up being a little short-sighted on that. 
So with that said, uh, yeah, my home base is Logan, Utah, and I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of people over the last 20 years. Uh, and I, I leave this with, with Joe Wheaton. Uh, he showed up at USU, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. And, and Trish, there's a, just been a number of people that have, have worked on it. The picture on the right is the system that I've spent an inordinate amount of time, which is this Temple Fork. Uh, Wally McFarland ran the, this beaver restoration uh, assessment tool and, and can sort of color code stream reaches based on the potential for, for beaver ponds. And, and again, the interesting part is he ran a lot of these models uh, before beaver really started to show up on this system. And, and uh, it, they quickly showed up and, and they, they, you know, I would have never guessed this little blue section on this map, which is this sort of pervasive beaver ponds would have had any beaver ponds when I started working on this system in the in 2000. But like this says, there's 18 at least now, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. The interesting part about this system and, and sort of Joe Wheaton's overall enthusiasm uh, is the state closed beaver trapping in this area. The Forest Service improved grazing practices uh, within, within this section, I'm gonna come back to it, and it moved a road out of the floodplain. So, it's sort of hard to keep those as independent effects since they all happen about the same time. But in a couple of slides, I'm gonna come back to these ponds. So, so just uh, remember that. Giving Jamie a, quest, a second for questions, but since you didn't come in, I will. So, you know, this is- Not, not seen any questions yet. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I give you time to, to jump in if necessary. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things about Wally's uh, uh, BRAT model is it, it, at least in that case is it's based on potential. Yeah, and, and, and when we start talking about ha habitat and limiting habitat, we have to recognize that Forest Service is still trying to get grazing consistently right. And I'll come back to that. I, I do think we're getting better and better, but as these pictures on the right show, we, we still have some room to improve. Yeah, we're also dealing with this sort of uh, conifer encroachment, whether that's juniper or, 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 or larger conifers and floodplains. Uh, we're also trying to get to this proper mix of pass, passive and active restoration. Although active restoration does a lot of good, it's really expensive and there's really no way we're going to be able to deal with, with sort of trying to actively fix all this. And, and so in a lot of cases, we're going to have to rely on things like beaver uh, to come back once the landscape's in, in the right shape uh, and take care of it. You know, certainly we, we have this GM1, so this is part of NFISH, modified grazing. You know, it's all the right things here, but you know, so we're supposed to prevent, or, uh, you know, that retard or prevent attainment of repair and management objective. But it's interesting to note that in 1995, the, 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 the the, the document that did this never mentions beaver. If you go to the Northwest Forest Plan, it me mentions beaver once, and that's only as a, as a threat to, to consuming mussels. Once you get into some of the newer documents, they start showing up, but, but it is important to recognize that, that a lot of these plans in the, 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 the 90s didn't really think too much about beaver. And, and so that that's causing it's sort of interesting to see these closures, right? Uh, like people were saying in the 20 to 40 years ago, where we really weren't thinking about how they played a role in, in, in protecting or improving these systems. So now back to Spawn Creek. So this is the, the upper part of Spawn Creek. Uh, this is a 1997 Google Earth picture. As you can see, that's all Aspen and that little blue circle is where those two ponds were. Uh, within this space in the state, uh, el eliminated gray our, our trapping and, and we altered the grazing process. And so in this case, what you'll see is this is 2009. On the southern portion of that, you'll see a new line that's a, an ex part of an exclosure. Uh, and, and, and again, it's, this exclosure is like a lot of exclosures. It's, it doesn't... It, probably gets rid of about 95% of the cattle use. There's still about a 5% uh, uh, use by cattle. And this is a south facing slope. And so uh, 
when the gate slams closed in November, when I'm up here hiking around looking, there's a lot of elk in here in the spring. And so just because cattle aren't in here doesn't mean large ungulates aren't in here. So anyway, we're about five years after these two closures and you see we've gone from one, one pond to two. We come back in 2014 and now we start to see uh, quite a few more ponds. But again, this is 10 years after uh, closure, both of grazing and trapping. And then when you get to 2017, and it's pretty amazing. I, I went up there one summer and, and the, the, the stream had gone to a few beaver ponds and basically just being a beaver complex from top to bottom. And this is a little bit over a kilometer. And so just recognize that, that you know, this limiting factor, my guess is this was a combination both of not having enough beavers and not having enough habitat. And, and, and so we often like to say it's one or the other, but my guess is, is it's a little bit of both, is that we need more beavers and we need more habitat. So that's, that's in this small wood systems. You know, I have a, another picture. This is a North Idaho project that I've been helping some people with. And what you can see, this is a common sort of big wood system. You can see there's, there, there's large conifers in, in and around this. What's happened is, you know, 100 years ago, people pushed the river to the left-hand side. You can see there's a channel along the left-hand side of this. And those little lines are these BDA, Beaver Dam analogs. The idea was to try to get this back on the floodplain. Uh, and, and, and so this is, if you look to the far left of this picture, what you'll see is where the, where the channel was pushed. So this is a BDA right in the middle of this picture. You can barely see the post sticking up to sort of get this channel back on the floodplain. Problem with this is that that channel on the left-hand side's down cut uh, probably six, eight, 10 feet, at least certainly by that much by the bottom of this. And it's really hard to get uh, this channel back on the floodplain just with this with these simple BDAs. Uh, you can also see there's there's not a lot of, uh, of willow, there's some, there's still grazing in here. so. That becomes somewhat problematic and you're starting to get some conifer encroachment down on the floodplain. And often when we look at these, and, and again, it, this plays a bigger role on some of the coastal organ. Uh, I was looking at some of that earlier today uh, on Google Maps. It, and so the stars where this restoration work, it, it's with a network of, of you know, you know, power lines and roads and paths and, 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 and uh, way past the harvest. And so it's hard to really put all these things in context when you're talking about beaver. Hey, Brett, can I pause you just for a minute? Good. Um, so so we, there's a question in the chat. Um, it's from Jefferson and Jefferson help me if I'm butchering this question. Uh, the question has to do with how how fast, what's what's the pace of the habitat recovery versus the, the, beaver, the beaver recovery? When again, I'm not going to totally defer on that, right? So, the, the you know, the between the, the cattle grazing, the elk grazing, and, and, and I published a paper uh, with a graduate student, it, it, there's a delay in, in the willow growth. Uh, and again, in this case on Spawn Creek, it was because of both the, the cattle and the elk. It looked like it was in the five or 10 year realm, but uh, when that finally started to escape, and again, a lot of it's similar to what Bob found in Yellowstone. Uh, once it escaped grazing, once it got tall enough, the beaver followed fairly quickly, but not not overnight. It took them five or ten years to to to, to fully uh, fill in both this system. And it's interesting, is you know, the Temple Fork watershed doesn't have a, a, a fence, but they've spent a lot more time because it's a high recreation area keeping cattle out there and it, that took an extra five years and, and that's seen the same sort of beaver explosion that Spawn Creek did. Hopefully Jefferson that was an, enough or? Yeah I was trying to get at the chicken or the egg if uh, sometimes it takes so long for vegetation to recover um, if the the beaver presence changed and their activity changed uh, 
at the same time before or after you were seeing a, a substantial noticeable change in the, the vegetation on the ground. And, and it, I think you're right on. I mean, so we saw a slow increase uh, with beavers and then a rapid increase at a certain point. And, and again, you know, there, there are always beavers in that system. That's why that, that one pond up, up top, uh, but it was really close to an aspen stand. And again, early in this process, they were hauling some of those aspens, you know, 150 yards down the hill. Uh, and so I think you're right on. It's a combination of both, and it's hard to tease that out. Okay. No more questions at this point. Keep going, Brett. Okay. Okay, and, and so, yeah, this is just uh, from an OSU master's thesis I found poking around the other day. And so on the x-axis is percent stream length adjacent to clear cut percent, and on the y-axis is percent of the stream length impounded by beaver. This is out on the alces, and what you can see is uh, there's a high relationship to this. And again, I, I'm not gonna try to say positive or negative on this, but if you, if you have open areas, beavers tend to come and fill those out on the coastal range. As you can see, these are fairly small uh, uh, systems, uh, but they get up to 80% you know, uh, of, of the stream is impounded by beaver in these systems. And the, the green circles are just to show that there are outliers again. So we won't ever have perfect knowledge of, of you know, in one case you've got 60% clear cut, but no beaver ponds. In another case, you've got none clear cut and you've got 40% beaver. So we will never know whether it's the chicken or the egg because they probably both happen. Uh, but I, I just thought this was an informative thing from, from 20 years ago. And this is the one I was looking at the, the, the Google map pictures today. Most of those are, are, are so grown now you can't see the beaver ponds in them anymore. So I'm gonna go from anecdotal to this design study and I'm gonna slowly go through this slide. Uh, so I, I used to oversee and I'm still involved with this PIBO effectiveness monitoring program. It evaluates the downstream most low gradient stream reach on, on public land and it does it on a five year return interval. In this case, the stream, the surveys initially avoided stream reaches with spanning uh, channel spanning beaver dams. And this is a five year return interval. And so they come back to the exact same site five years later and then 10 years later. Uh, between 2001 and 2017, we had 888 unique stream reaches that were evaluated these three times. So, you know, it's first time uh, five years later, a second time and a third time five years later. And again, so when you look at this, when it comes to beavers, there's really four potential outcomes. The, the stream reach was undammed during the first visit, dammed the second, but the channel spanning had been breached by the third. Uh, the second possible outcome was the, the stream reach was undammed the first and second and dammed by the third. And the third one was the, the stream reach was undammed the first visit, but dammed the second and third. And so because that's five year return interval, we can start to get some kind of occupancy estimate and recognize that you know, number four is that there are no channel spanning dams. So notes taken over this time frame. So there's 15 years at, well, actually it was just 11 years at these sites, you know, the first five years later and the second five years later, it's 11 year span. Uh, but anyway, there, there were the 113 of these sites had evidence uh, of beaver and 43 of those stream reaches had channel spanning beaver dams in at least one of those three scenarios I described above. Uh, and to sort of evaluate the effects uh, paired with the closest unimpacted reach. And so it looks like this. Uh, so that as you can see the beaver, the red, and the, the controller are, are right next to it. And, and so you've got this Oregon uh, red circle. And again, so there were two that we found in that, uh, but there weren't a lot. And, and again, so there, there, there are beavers in the area of, of the, the types of streams we, we sample, which are low gradient, generally fish bearing streams. Idaho, Southern Idaho, you can see a lot of those. Uh, and it's interesting, the reason I put that, that red circle in Montana is is that's the, the Beaverhead National Forest. And so you would expect 
uh, a few beavers there, but we didn't find any of them, at least during the, the on the stream sets that we looked at. So here, you know, here's this before after control impact. One of the big things that that we that people need to or do recognize is that uh, is that wood. So there, what you can see is there's no increase in wood with beaver, and that's because most monitoring programs, including the pack fish and fish group. Uh, the, the wood they evaluate is too big. In this case, it's just 10 centimeters by three uh, meters long. But it, you, when, you, when you're even at that size, most of the, the wood is smaller than that. You don't see any change. That's that upper left graph. What you do see is uh, right below it is residual pool depth. It is a very rapid response in uh, re residual pool depth and an increase in pool percent. And, and that's not surprising. That's what you'd expect to find. The nice thing about this is we, we have in Paiba a whole bunch of different factors. And again, this is over 43 pairs controlled for some covariances that uh, you do see a decreased woody cover uh, in the riparian area, which makes sense because they're using that for, for beaver ponds. You see a slight increase in the number of uh, days greater than 15 C, but not very many, and it's not so big to carry over to number of days over 18 C. You don't see any of that macroinvertebrate response you'd see, you'd expect with sort of degraded habitats so of the, the standard health indicators. Beavers tend to pick sites with smaller substrate, uh, greater bank stability, less forest cover, and higher water temperatures. Uh, and again, that's often because they're a little bit more exposed to begin with. And the important part here is passive restoration with several 30 kilogram animals do what costs the federal managers five to $10,000 to complete, which is to, to, to increase residual pool depth in pools. So if we were to actively do it, it's a much more expensive exercise. So the next question is how do we detect this in this sort of overall monitoring of stream habitat? This is a paper I published a couple of years ago with a couple of co-authors. What you can see is in the upper part, uh, wood is increasing both in reference and managed sites, uh, but there is a difference. And, and, and again, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that one. Median particle size in managed is increasing, which is good, what we'd expect is good, and decreasing in reference. And, and we explain most of that because of the, the, the high number of fires in the Frank Church, which is where a lot of these reference sites come from. The beaver signal on this really isn't enough to increase the overall pool depth across all these streams. And just the wood frequency increases the pool frequency. Yep. And again, things could be getting better. Uh, and, and certainly this is not as fast as a lot of like people would like to, to to see, but we're also getting sort of a climate change and a stationarity signal in here. Uh, some things uh, have changed and, and others aren't gonna change in a hurry because of conifer encroachment identification because of fire exclusion and infrastructure. And again, it's important to recognize at least in, in Oregon when it comes to like buffer strips so the the, the, that's the, the buffer strip and, and meters. As you can see, the Northwest Forest Plan, which covers a lot of the coastal range, is much uh, wider than either the state forest plans or the forest ministry. So again, the only point here is that, is that we're seeing some change. It's not as fast as we'd like. There's indication of both climate change and, and, and that's all with fairly restrictive harvest uh, within this area. So before I hand it off to Brian, the, the important conclusions of this sort of um, uh, more design-based study is that more than 2% of the evaluated stream reaches had beaver dams added. You know, this is similar to what Anderson and uh, Schaefroff found in Arizona, but less than what Dimler and Bestrick found in 2008. Uh, you know, the, some of these dams persist longer than five years. That one in the upper, upper Spawn Creek has been there in aerial photos since the 30s. Uh, beaver dam expectancy depends upon environmental conditions, land management practices, and watershed characteristics. And if you put all this together and look forward, uh, between five and 15% of the low gradient, medium-sized streams in the interior Columbia 
should have active beaver dams in the next couple decades. And again, I, I uh, that that that's five to fifteen percent of the stream reaches. That so that that that's a lot, <laughs> uh, but that's still less than what uh, Didenbrenner suggested in two thousand eighteen, which suggested a third of the high quality stream reaches would have beaver dams. The difference between what we found uh, and, and that one is probably that not all this is high quality habitat. And so with that, you got, a, you got a question from Samantha. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks, Brett. And before you pass it off, I just had a question. You'll have to forgive me because I am not a scientist. So I try to simplify um, a lot of these different studies so I can understand them better. But as I'm understanding what you're saying, really the best way to look at improving um, the benefits of beaver is by one, really looking at habitat restoration, habitat benefits, either by grazing removal, which was the first instance, or by human improvements that we could make or invest in that are kind of expensive. And then also increasing beaver populations, you know, reducing those limiting factors so beavers can thrive or maybe relocating beaver is also expensive. So increasing beaver, improving habitat, then we can start seeing the stream benefits. Is that correct? Am I correct in kind of my synopsis, the simplistic synopsis of a policy person, not a scientist? Well, I think the first two were uh, okay. correct. I'm not sure about the last, right? I, okay. I, I, I'm not sure we're at carrying capacity. I don't think there's much evidence that beaver are at carrying capacity in these systems yet. Uh huh. So, I mean, I, I think... And again, I, I think you're starting to see, and again, I'll, I'll give a lot of this to Joe, uh, we, in our neighborhood, right, we're seeing beavers show up in lots of places that the habitat hasn't changed just because there are a lot more beavers. Uh, and that's not just based on this. That, I mean, we had, and again, I explained this a week ago, we had a, we had a power outage two weeks ago because a beaver fell a tree on the power lines. And the standard response in some other community didn't have the papers on this all the time would have probably been to, to, to kill them and remove them. In this case, they trapped them and, and hauled them up to Forest Service land and released them. Uh, but again, so I'm running, I see run over beavers now in areas I wouldn't have even contemplated 20 years ago seeing run over beavers. And so so it's more allowing them to disperse then further so they can have their benefits. And again, I and probably use more, when densities get higher, you end up probably using more lower quality areas. I mean, that's that's the argument with fish, right? Is, is they use the high quality stuff first. And if you've got enough of them, then they'll start using the, the moderate and the low quality stuff. And the problem is when you're at low, low density, they're only using the high quality stuff. And so we confuse that with the carrying capacity issue at times, at least we do with fish. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Thank you. And, and thanks for entertaining my, my questions for my neat naivete around beaver science. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions for you, Brett, at this point. I want to go We're ahead. handing it over to Brian for his- So are you seeing my screen? <clears throat> it looks like we're seeing your screen, but it's in, um, there it is in presenter mode. Terrific. Okay, before I jump in, I do wanna, uh, yeah, as far as grazing removal, I'd say you need uh, sufficient grazing strategies that are that are compatible with beaver. It doesn't have to be removal necessarily, but um, anyway, I'm gonna focus my talk on um, some case studies of active restoration projects uh, on, by the Forest Service on or near um, national forest system lands. The focus of these are on aquatic and riparian ecosystems with a strong but not sole emphasis on fish um, because of, and water quality issues. And because of that, there is a strong connection to beaver. Um, and the intent here is to quickly show what's been done um, on a handful of case studies here um, and to briefly illustrate um, some of the outcomes with both pictures as well as monitoring data. Importantly, um, these are not quantitative studies. We're not doing quantitative studies on beaver response to these treatments, but we, we are doing quantitative studies on how ecological conditions and processes that are relevant to aquatic ecosystems 
um, are changing and in response to the treatments, and those have direct relevance to beaver suitability. Um, and just you know, before I dive in here, I do want to. Uh, these are these are highlighted in a 2019 paper by Powers et al. This is just one kind of restoration treatment that we're doing, but it is particularly relevant to beaver. Um, and so I just want to kind of step back, though, in some background as to you know, why we're talking about this. Just want to remind folks that we have substantially altered um, some of our land and streamscapes in some places in Oregon and, the, and in the West broadly because of a whole host of impacts like stream channelization and drainage of the landscape, um, straightening of our streams, river regulation, large wood removal, mining, um, in a, insufficient grazing practices in some cases, and, and uh, beaver management practices in some cases. So a whole host, it's the cumulative kind of interactions that kind of Brett hit on. And in some cases, um, passive restoration, that is just managing the landscape um, a, a bit differently to allow for natural recovery of ecological processes is sufficient to jumpstart and allow those processes, those conditions to recover. And, and that would include um, enabling beaver to do their work. Um, and that helps to recover all those valley floor processes. Other times though, we do need to kind of, or we want to jumpstart um, that process and get it happening faster, much faster in many cases, via targeted active restoration. And so that's what I'll be focusing on in my, my slides here. So we'll give a little tour of some of these sites in Oregon, just a handful of them. Um, and I do wanna emphasize that these are being focused in these unconfined valley floors, which again, have relevance to beaver. So, so back to the uh, stream evolution triangle, just a reminder that it's really um, biology, geology, and hydrology that work together to really structure the form and function of our streams and rivers and, and out there in the woods and in the, the rangelands. And it's the balance of those processes that, that really govern that. Um, and so importantly though, humans, uh, human activity can change the relative controls um, in a particular system with consequences to stream form and function. So this is a case study in Weiches Creek near the Deschutes National Forest where stream channelization and other land uses um, cause this channel to incise that is down cut into its valley floor, become disconnected from its floodplain and with a whole cascade of, of result effects on vegetation and biota and such. And so it's really kind of locked in that geologic process corner in this case. Um, and that's, an un, you know, that's a human artifact. Um, and so what we did is we did a large scale valley restoration project to where we basically temporarily allowed um, through filling those channels and, and regrading portions of the valley floor, hydrology controls there, water, water everywhere temporarily. Um, but we quickly get recovery of uh, vegetation where you now have vegetation and, and animals, including beaver, exerting controls on, on stream function and process. And you get to the desired condition we were seeking here, which is a greater balance of the relative controls of those processes. And so we are, this is just another kind of image of that. The stream was uh, incised and, and running along the, the, um, the tree line there. It was, it was a straight, straightened channel in size. We, we filled that channel, re regraded portions of the valley floor temporarily. You see you know, some significant disturbance, but very quickly you see uh, a whole lot of natural recovery of that system on the bottom there. Um, very diverse, complex aquatic and riparian ecosystem. And we are... Um, quantifying those effects. This is work that Brian Kluwer did from NOAA. He modeled the, um, the flow, the hydraulics uh, before and after that restoration work. You can see on the left, you have largely have a single threaded channel that's incised with relatively um, high velocities when you compare it to the after restoration where you have much more of that valley floor engaged in these kinds of, uh, during these flows. And um, so many more channel types uh, being accessed and relatively lower um, flow velocity. So all of that has relevance to aquatic and riparian ecosystems and um, beaver. And we do see evidence of beaver activity um, in these systems. Again, we've not quantified the effect in a before or after context, but we know the beaver utilizing these systems and we know the conditions are more conducive um, to their utilization of them. So another case study is in uh, Five Mile Bell uh, on, on the Sayuslav forest on the coast range. This again is a consequence of legacy land use impacts that caused this channel to incise uh, deeply into the valley floor. Um, you can see that person for scale. And because of that, the flows rarely accessed um, the floodplain prior to restoration, um, very high flow velocities and, um, and such. And so again, with a, a large scale project to address those issues, um, you again see a fair bit of uh, disturbance initially, but really significant and very quick recovery of, of vegetation. You can't 
barely walk through the willow galleries out there on that landscape with the vegetation recovering. And importantly, that whole valley floor is now engaged with flows during much more frequently um, than it was, was in the past. And we've quantified that effect in a number of ways, including looking at groundwater response. So you see on the left, prior to restoration, a whole lot of variability um, in, in groundwater throughout the year. And then after restoration, we've elevated that groundwater table to near the surface, to being within the rooting zone of the vegetation. We see the vegetation response. And importantly, you don't get that intraannual variability, um, that is the within year variability uh, in the groundwater table in that case. And we do again see evidence of beaver in both in, in dams, but also um, images. Of, or I mean, we've, we have photo cameras for the, the animals as well. So another case study back on the other side of the Cascades again is the, near the Ochoco National Forest. Um, again, a history of land use impacts, and there was some beaver dam removals in this system, um, and uh, that was only one of uh, a numerous impacts. But it, it did again incise into its valley floor, became disconnected from the stream channel. Uh, changes in vegetation, it dries out much more quickly in the landscape and via our restoration work. Um, this is the post-treatment conditions. Um, and you can see much more of that valley engaged um, with very vigorous productive vegetation, including later in the year, this is in July, and this is during a drier year than in June of a wetter year. And so that kind of response is consistent with the, uh, the findings of Hauser et al, who basically posited the if you're being effective with this kind of restoration, you should shift the relationship between annual precipitation and NDVI, which is a vegetation greenness index. You should shift that relationship pre and post restoration. And we in fact have seen that where we have a greener landscape under the same kind of, uh, of precipitation um, situation. And in fact, a drier one. And so we think we're being effective with these kinds of treatments. And the last one I'll, I'll hit on um, is uh, the South Fork Mackenzie River. This is the largest project that we've implemented on a, you know, a valley, large valley um, stream or river valley uh, reconnection effort. Uh, Ellen Wool kind of uh, summarized some of this work in her recent um, article in EOS magazine. Um, you can see the scale of that effort, very large, uh, substantial effort. And again, you can see that in the picture on the left. Um, and I want to point you to the picture on the right, the image on the right. Now you can see the pre-flow or the pre-restoration tree. Uh, flow paths for base flow, that's the, the lower flows in, in dark blue, um, and then the post-treatment in, in lighter blue. So you can see much more of that valley floor is engaged during a wider, much wider range of flows, much more complex flow paths accessed um, with a broader diversity of um, flow depths and flow velocities and such. And this is what some of those rewatered channels look like um, after, the, after they've uh, that project. And so again, we do see beaver utilizing um, these kinds of, of systems, very in, in different ways, obviously, in across these sites. So in summary, uh, we are trying to use a combination of uh, passive restoration at the broad scale, um, but also targeted active restoration um, to improve aquatic and riparian habitats um, for many organisms, including beaver. And we really need, we do need to have beaver on the landscape to help um, finish that job that we're jump starting and to help maintain that over time. Um, one important part of this is that we are concentrating our active restoration work in certain portions of the landscape that are particularly important and trying to do that at a watershed scale. And so to do that, we're, we and our partners like OEB are concentrating in particular areas that are highlighted there in blue. And that may be one dimension, one single dimension of how we think about beaver management on the landscape um, moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it back to Brett. Thank you, Brian. If I can uh, stop sharing here. There you go. Are we good? Okay. We're good, Brett. Looks perfect. Well, yeah, so I, I deleted one slide in here, but uh, just to make the, the idea is to get, you know, to get you all talking about it. I mean, I obviously have my own view on all this, but so part of it's how do you tie all this together? This is a, it's hard to get an idea of what beaver density looks like. So this is from Minnesota and you can see the scale on the bottom, 10 kilometers. It's in a national park. Uh, 
And what you can, so these are active uh, beaver lodges, right? So the, this is, this gives you a pretty uh, good idea of what uh, beaver activity can look like. Certainly not all coastal Pacific Northwest looked like this, but probably a lot of it did. I mean, the, there, there were commercial trapping there and they moved from there to, uh, to Oregon to continue as, the, as they moved and sort of reduced the, 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 the beaver population. One of the interesting things I thought about this paper, because it was more about wolves, is, is that this pack actually ended up consuming 85 uh, beavers in a year. And so their number is so high that they, they end up being a fairly large component of the, of the protein biomass. And, and again, it, I just think this picture gives you an idea uh, of what densities could look like. In this case, it's not a highly developed area. Uh, so I, I just think, you know, we, we say we don't know what things look like. Well, they probably look at, at least in this area, at least like this, maybe more. And, and that's pretty high density. So, you know, going back to what Wally was doing, this was this is the same type of tool, uh, this beaver restoration assessment tool in Idaho. Uh, this does sort of existing capacity and historic capacity, trying to estimate uh, what the change has been. And so in the Southwest Idaho, well, let's, let's consider that sort of the, the Northeast Oregon. It, they, they, suggest about there's a bit about a 40 per seven percent decline in, in the, the number of, of uh, sort of capacity and, and again I, I think this gets back to the question that's already been asked you know when you read this nearly all the capacity loss from historic conditions can be explained in terms of repairing vegetation loss vegetation com, uh, conversion and degradation associated with high intensity land use you know, that includes conversion to urban and agricultural, uh, overgrazing and uh, repairing in upland areas and, and conifer encroachment in wet meadows. And again, the question is, which comes first for chicken and, or the egg? I, I find it interesting that people were moving beavers out here 40 years ago. Uh, and again, that was still when the, the Oregon was harvesting a huge number of acres and, and, and grazing considerably more cows than it is now. And so while you could argue that that some of this may be limited by habitat uh, on public land 40 years ago, the last 10 or 15 years have seen some improvements. And so even if you're talking about the chicken and the egg, my, my, my thought would be we have higher capacity on public land now than we did 10 or 15 years ago. So that, that this is the small, the small wood systems. So I'm going to now go to the large wood systems. And again, it's a little bit more interesting here. So this is from a paper Burnett did in 2007. And uh, she and her co-authors looked at potential coho and steelhead habitats. And, and they're really similar to what beaver like. They like to have some stream flow, not high power and, and, and fairly large valley widths. Uh, and so if you put these little purple triangles on things, what you can see is is in some of them like the lower Columbia, there's not a lot of public land in, in those types of areas, uh, coho and steelhead. Uh, you go to the mid coast and up uh, Umpqua, that there, there, there are a lot more opportunities. And so you know, this talks about, uh, you know, where and what uh, you should do. And so, you know, there's not always going to be opportunities on public lands everywhere because at least, and again, this is not east of the Cascades, this is west of the Cascades, uh, because a lot of that's in private land ownership. And, and Brian laughed at me the other day when I said, you know, that, that only 50% of Oregon's in public land ownership compared to 65% of that in, in, in Utah. And again, it's an important difference in the 15% because often that these lower floodplain areas that, that have a lot of potential, not only for coho, steelhead and beaver, uh, but for, for, for fields and, and, and for houses. Uh, uh, yeah, we sh should get some more. Again, we, we talked, I, I heard a lot about talking of monitoring. And again, uh, I'm going to get to that here in a second as I wrap this up. 
I don't know if we need another study to answer this question. I mean, I do think this is down to policy. So I just searched uh, web of science between 2000 and 2020 with Beaver in the title. And you can see uh, that we more than doubled the number of publications with Beaver in the title. Uh, and, and so this has become a, certainly a, a very hot topic in research. And again, we can't get research that applies to everywhere. That's not ever gonna happen. Uh, but we do, do, do need to do a better job of tracking populations in ponds. I, I don't know if that's necessarily research, uh, uh, but, but again, the, if you want research, there, there's more and more research coming out on beavers all the time. So, you know, when, when I look at all this together for Oregon, right? So it, would it be beneficial to stop tramp, trapping? Of course it would be on public lands, especially as we, we change our practices. So even if we argue that, you know, maybe the carrying capacity was limited in the past, I, I think we're improving that uh, over time. I, I certainly have seen beaver expand on public lands over the last 10 or 15 years uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, part of that's because Beavers have uh, grazing practices that have increased. Some of them, the coast range is going to rely on some of what Brian was talking about. Uh, we're going to have to maybe give them a jump start because some of those systems have, 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 have changed fairly dramatically. You know, so this simple thing about, uh, and again, I, I've heard and seen this, you know, management practices are catching up with closures. Uh, I, I looked at Murders Creek, which part of South Fork of John Day, if you wanted to just go with anecdotal uh, in the last four or five years, it appears much like Spawn Creek. The number of beaver ponds have increased rapidly. That I think that's with them on the closures. It's also recognized that closures would be harmful to trappers. I mean, certainly uh, that that that's something that you all have to deal with. I, 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 but again, we that that's what needs to be talked about. I do think when we start talking about direct human mortality. It, it's also related to problem beavers, lack of understanding, and the part we're talking about trapping here. You know, I, both my dad and my granddad uh, spent time and had had houses overlooking drainages within the within the North Umpqua, uh, yeah, North Umpqua, and, and Umpqua. And certainly, I remember my granddad forty years ago shooting beavers off his porch anytime he saw them in the stream, and my my dad doing the same thing when it came to trapping when they came up and got one of his apple trees. And so we talk about trapping, but that at least in my thought may not be, and again, we don't have numbers because there is no requirement, at least that I could find in Oregon for people to, if you're doing it on your own land to, 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 to actually talk about problem beavers. Uh, and again, understand that's why I keep pointing to Joe. I mean, we have a, beaver pond in a Walmart parking lot. It's got, you know, the, the capacity to, where they can't flood the, the parking lot, but it, you know, that Joe's worked with, 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 with Walmart to, to maintain that, 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 uh, that set of beaver ponds there. And, and again, you know, we talked about what's the mortality of beavers on public lands, you know, around here, one of the biggest things 20 years ago before I think Joe really got some signs going was Boy Scouts just, just planking. I mean, because people didn't know the value of beavers, I think we need to do a do a better job of, of that. Again, so you know, do we need more information? Probably. You know, we should monitor the, the things we are finding is re related to this climate resilience. So that's this left slide, and again, so it's hard to you re to read, but it's more is uh, in in DVI reduction, so it's less green. So that brown is no beaver activity on fires. The blue is beaver activity in fires. And the height of it's the reduction in, in photosynthetic output. And so there's been about a 70% reduction in photosynthetic output from repairing areas where you don't have beavers and you did have a fire. The right one, it's it, it's it's 13%. And, and again, I stole this from Brian because he sent it, because this is the way things often look. And again, obviously this didn't stop a fire, but it could. And so I do think we need to think about beavers in, in a larger role uh, in public management. Uh, you know, we can close it and check, but again, we can, we can do that 
uh, retroactively. One of the nice things about, uh, and that's why I put a publication down there to the bottom right. We looked at NDVI and I was looking at fire and I was surprised at how often I picked up what was in this little blue circle. And it's pretty obvious once you get this from a change in NDVI. So I was looking at those same things every five years and trying to see uh, and see where fires were and if that affected streams, what you end up seeing a lot of times are, we didn't monitor that beaver impacted reach. It, it was, you know, a couple kilometers upstream of the stream reach we, we monitor, which was at the bottom of this. But you can see beavers influenced this. And again, it was easy just to go to the Google Maps and see that. But, but you see a lot of these NDVI changes along streams that, that are tied to beavers. And so I think what I want to close is, is, is that uh, I do think we some more work on this it, it could be helpful, but I, I think most of the important things uh, we do know is, is uh, and again, I, I think uh, between what Jimmy presented, what Michael presented in this, should at least provide enough room to, to, to talk about this issue. And I think with that, I'm going to quit. All right. Well, let's open it up for some questions, and um, we'll make a. I'll make a slight adjustment in the time so that we can have the time that we need to ask questions. So we were going to stop at three fifteen, which would only give like se seven minutes for questions. That's not adequate. So let's take questions until um, about three thirty. We'll just check in and see uh, how folks are doing with with questions. So, what questions do you have for? Brett and Brian. Stan's got his hand up. Go ahead, Stan. Brett, um, so the Smoky the Beaver picture that you just showed us, great riparian area. Do you know, was that area open to trapping or was it closed? Were, were those benefits, you know, gained during an, in an area that was actually had regulated harvest or not, you know? So Brian, I stole that from you. Do you know? Well, actually, you just stole a picture of the bootleg fire, which was not related to Emily's study. Um, no, I know. Um, oh, were you talking, Stan? Were you talking about the study from? Uh, the no, it, is that picture is that had closed? To trying to determine whether that trapping's open or closed there. Uh, it's on this Fremont Wainema National Forest. I don't know exactly. Um, what the... I don't think we have any closures on the Fremont Redeema, but I could be wrong, but I don't think there are. So actually that photograph then could be, that's in an area that I assume, because I'm not aware of the closures there, was in an area that was open to trapping. So those benefits could be received both ways. Well, I mean, I, I think, again, I, I mean, the idea of, of trapping is to still have sustainable populations. So I, I mean... So, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, there are lots of beavers coming in in places that don't close to trapping. The question is, is uh, it, would it go faster or different? Again, I, I mean, I. We really don't know that, do we? Well, I, I, I do think you, you know, if you get more beavers, right? And, and again. Even if you just argue it's because the Forest Service is doing a better job, uh, that you do know that you would get more of this. So if we quit hunting elk, we'd have more elk. Yeah, that, yeah to a point. I don't think they're at carrying capacity. So sustainable when we do our regulatory processes, ORS 496-012 talks about sustainable, no serious depletion of our populations. In your judgment, do you think that Oregon's current regulated harvest on beaver is having a serious depletion of that population? Well, again, I, you know, I, 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 I am going to try to stay away from this. <laughs> well, you, but, you but not completely, you right? Were, I mean, you were touching. I, I, I think you can not, but I, and again, I think certainly you can trap out beaver populations and, and, and to, for, for you, just because sustainability on beaver, especially the way I look at organs, uh, it's hard to know. So it's pretty clear that they may be sustained, just like elk herds, right? 
They may be sustainable across the range, but not every bit, everywhere you want them. So I guess what I'm saying is this is an assumption. Again, so what, what, what's my assumption is? Your assumption is Oregon's current regulated beaver harvest is limiting colony pers persistence or colony expansion. That's what I get out of this. I haven't seen any direct quantified, quantifiable data that shows us that our current regulated harvest system is having a negative impact on habitat restoration for salmonids. Is that true or not true? Again, so I, I mean, I, I, I can answer that. I thought I, I did, but again, so the, so the, 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 the other side is, so you're saying they're at carrying capacity? No, 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 I'm not going there. What I'm saying is, and just a simple question, in your professional opinion, do you feel that Oregon's current regulated beaver harvest is having a negative impact on salmon, salmonid recovery or on beaver population persistence and expansion? So I, I so I think I overall. Here. Sorry, Stan. I just I don't think this is appropriate to just lay in a bread about regulation. Well, no, 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 I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm sitting here giving a presentation. <laughs> okay, so. yeah. So I just want to flag that for Jamie. Like this line of questioning doesn't feel. Well, and again, I and I appreciate it. So I mean, my point, my thought would be is it's it, it, and that's why it's sort of related to public land. I, I think they're it's probably fine in places and and not in others. I mean. You look at the, 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 the research, somewhere in that 20 to 35% mortality rate, you start getting unsustainable populations. The way the regulations are right now in Oregon where you can sort of catch them all, from what I can tell, you could <laughs> certainly, it, you could, right? I mean, it, it's not like you can do one per colony. And again, correct me if I misread the, the regs, you could collapse an individual colony. And then if you walked away, just like fishermen, it would probably come back. Thank you. So thanks, Sam, for flagging that. Brett and Stan, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next couple <laughs> of people we've got hands up. <laughs> so Kyle, go ahead. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, actually, I, I think there it's two different questions. One, one was for Brett and we talked, you talked a lot about the, oh, my watch is thanking us as well. Um, the, the large wood and the small wood and that kind of stuff. And, and, and you touched about the coast range and Brian, maybe this is yours from the monitoring as well. I wonder about the influence of our, our propensity to focus on large wood retention uh, and, and, and right, a desired future condition in riparian areas on the west side and certainly the coast. And if that's overriding, like how do we offset that if beavers are also our goal, right? So we've, we've kind of gone all in on fish and shade and riparian buffer, but that's kind of not ideal for, for beavers. So Brett, what, what's the sweet spot there? How do, how do we start, how do we find that, that balance? Let Brian go first if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think we are we are low in large wood for in in those big wood systems where where wood was a controlling um, factor in in the structure and function of those systems, and that's due to harvest of old growth trees and stream cleaning, right? Where we actively remove massive amounts of old, old which we don't do anymore. <laughs> no, I know, I know, right? So we do, but we do have that legacy, right? That's what we're dealing with. Is like, so we're tr we do need to have that component in there. But I do agree with it. We need um, diversity in the systems and those riparian management, those riparian reserves are what they're called different things, but they are not kind of no management, no touch zones. They should be managed to achieve desired conditions. And increasing, increasingly, we understand the role of beaver in some of these systems. And so we are doing thinning and trying to diversify and get some hardwoods into some of those, those systems. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a no touch game um, at, at all. So I don't think it's an either or in that scenario, we we need to be both recruiting that large wood uh, to deal with that deficit, um, but also uh, having s some of that diversity with hardwood components and such too. So, so Brett, do you think a uh, relative to the the focus on trapping, can we overcome that habitat condition right now with simply a, a trapping focus? Well, well, again, so this is always interesting to me, right? And that's why I tried to. I mean, it's not one or the other. It is a big wood, small wood. Uh, 
Beavers don't like conifers, at least as, as much as, but they do, will occasionally be in them. I, uh, sure. You, know, you, you go to Oregon, or sorry, you go to Alaska and you get these major systems that are, you know, wall to wall beaver ponds along conifers. And again, I, I don't know. I don't think we've spent much time thinking about that. I certainly haven't, except for the last five years is, is you know, uh, in a lot of cases we don't have, we've got roads, all those things. So it makes it really tough. But, you know, did Oregon look like some of those Alaskan streams where you got conifers going up the top and down in the middle of the floodplain, it was just beavers and hardwoods. You know, we just don't have those types of systems to look at. And that's why I went to Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, I mean, maybe there is an opportunity there, right? We, we, I think there is. Yeah. Um, and then Jamie, I'll, I've got another one more on the grazing side, but I can let other people go and we'll see if we still have time. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kyle. And uh, we've got Amy, Jill, and Chris with their hands up, and then we'll loop back to you, Kyle. Amy? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't really have a, a question. I just wanted to push back for just a second, um, you know, on, on Samantha's comment there when Stan was talking with Brett. Um, I didn't, <clears throat> pardon me, that was not, uh, in my opinion, um, Stan laying into Brett that was trying to simply quantify and qualify statements that were made um, within that presentation, much in the same way that Samantha questioned Dr. Taylor in the last uh, meeting. So, I don't believe there's anything there to flag. Um, I just want to kind of push back a little bit on that, that there are times when we need to have pretty strong dialogue to get to uh, what is a perceived point or assumption that we see in a presentation. And, and thanks on that. I mean, I, 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 I agree, right? I, I, you know, several people warned me about talking about harvest. Uh, I do teach fisheries management. You, no, I'm just saying from the forest service because it, it can get conflictive, but that's what you all are talking about. Uh, and, and I feel I have both data, but then he's asking me my opinion. That's certainly not the agency's opinion, so. Thank you. Can I respond really quick, Jamie? Thanks, Amy, yeah, of course. for flagging that. And I appreciate the feedback and I got caught up in the moment as well. So yes, he did this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Samantha. And, and for all of you, I mean, as a facilitator, I'm gauging, I mean, Brett seemed like he was handling it okay. <laughs> so he was, so I was always he watching was. to see. Kind of it okay. he was. I was always watching to see. It's like, is Brett like, you know, getting in a corner or what's happening and how can we help him out? And I'm but sorry, my mom was a police that. officer too. So I, I'm, I'm very <laughs> sensitive to interrogation. Um, so I apologize. I'm muting myself now. I'm going to be quiet for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> no, don't be quiet for the rest of the meeting, Samantha. All right, let's get back on our group. We've got Jill and then Chris. Yeah, what um, what this, as well as the other presentations that we've had um, indicate to me that um, if we're going to be looking at, at closures uh, sometime in the future or now, um, that we really need to do it on a watershed basis similar that how we manage fisheries as opposed to just a broad statewide, um, you know, you can trap everywhere or rather than, okay, we've identified these certain watersheds where we want improvement or a federal agency wants improvement in beaver habitat. And so we're going to manage those particular watersheds for limited beaver harvest or no beaver harvest Whereas elsewhere, um, where there appears to be just fine watersheds uh, with beaver in them, then we can we can leave those um, as they are. So um, it just seems like perhaps uh, we need to get towards more fine management uh, than to have broad stroke management in the future. So that's the research seems to be possibly pointing to that, the research that I've heard of. So I just wanted to um, offer that here based on the, the research provided. Bill, thanks for that. And that's actually, you know, we've got several hands up, but that I want, where, where Jill is going is the kind of um, thinking 
that we're hoping you'll start to, to uh, talk about in the small groups. And so, you know, starting to connect the dots with everything that you've heard and, you know, what does that mean in terms of some recommendations that we might want to consider. So I appreciate you, Jill, thinking about that. Um, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, and yeah, Becky, I can never find it either. It's in the under the reactions button at the bottom. Um, so I'll see if I can find it in there. I'll lower my hand. Um, so Brett, I'm, can you remove your Forest Service hat and speculate as a fish biologist um, and a wildlife biologist is my next question, is my question. Um, the examples have been brought up a bunch of times about regulating the population size through, through hunting and trapping. And that's done you know, with standard, um, standardly with, with ungulates, with, with deer and elk. Um, beaver are slightly different in that they make their own habitat. And in the sense, if they're allowed to persist, then, then floodplain modification becomes more intense, but sort of the, the carrying, the local carrying capacity goes up. You showed that example with Spawn Creek over 10 years, the same stream reach going from one or two ponds to 18 ponds. So that's in a sense, the ability for that reach of stream to produce beaver went up. Um, so it's it's not a fixed quantity as beaver are allowed to persist on the landscape. So I'm wondering if you can put that in the context of marine reserves. Um, so that was a really um, contentious management decision that, that appeared on the landscape about 20 or so years ago to have closures in trawling grounds um, to stop fishing in large areas with the initial intent of just protecting those areas and allowing the, the, the ground, the trawlable habitat um, to, to recover because the extraction, the fishing itself destroyed the habitat which allowed the fish to recruit and grow. And, and surprisingly, what has come out of the implementing marine, those marine protected areas is that yes, they are showing a recovery of the fish. So, so the age structure of the fish and the species compositions uh, are, of the assemblages are changing, but also the areas adjacent to the marine protected areas are becoming more productive as fishery habitat because those marine, marine protected areas export uh, fish into the, export, the, the open um, harvestable areas. Can, can you think about um, a regulatory, a patchwork regulatory environment um, that allows increased carrying capacity by longer residence time of beavers on the landscape and the potential impact that has in a sense of, of feeding um, those effects, not just in the downstream water, but from the population effects in beaver in particular um, in into adjacent areas. Yeah, and I, I can't, I mean, I, you know, that, that's the interesting thing here. The hard part is to do that independently where you're talking about those marine reserves, you get, angling off that but but here you've got you're, you've got a community changing its sort of perception about beavers as well and so you know that because there's as you just pointed out because there's so many dams up there beavers don't really i mean there's a they you know they're pretty territorial so they, they're filling in most of their high quality habitat and so i've certainly seen more beaver carcasses down in the main stem river I you know, used to never see those, but it, it's obvious that, and again, I don't, I don't know Utah system well enough, but there's certainly as many or more beavers coming out of that system now from that, from that trapping. You're certainly seeing more beaver ponds. Uh, you, you're probably seeing a few more complaints. You know, so I, I work some other people down the valley. You're starting to see beavers show up where they never have, and so they're now having to remove those out of culverts, you know, down on the flatland where, you know, a lot of this stuff has changed way up top. So I, I do think that m Marine Reserve works in this case, right? Because we're changing lots of things where you end up with not only more beavers where you, where you have a closure, but more beavers outside the closure. Thanks, Chris and um, Brett. So Brian. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for those presentations, very interesting. So um, I was just wondering, you know, you talked about basically a number of specific areas where there was there was restoration work done and it, it seemed like it was mostly a combination of, um, of uh, you know, different things, including, including uh, uh, 
limitations or closures on beaver harvest, um, you know, as well as grazing changes in grazing practices and some some uh, uh, you know human type uh, alterations of the of the stream channels and so forth. So you know, and I'm just wondering in those, can you talk a little bit about these areas where you've been able to do that, where you've been able to do a restoration project that's involved a closure? Um, you know, how how does that how is that happening both in terms of you know, from a regulatory perspective, how do those projects come about? How are they funded? You know, I'm just wondering if there's anything in there that might give us ideas about what to recommend in our uh, small groups. Well, okay. yeah, so in this Sorry, case, if I, could, if I could add one more caveat to that, I'm, I'm also curious to maybe ODFW needs to answer this, but I'm wondering if they've been involved in, uh, in, in these projects where there's been some kind of a closure. Sorry to interrupt your answer. No, 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 I think, I think sort of, Jill hit this on the head earlier is that there, there was a, a, an interest and there was a, a, a operating space, right? Which is Spawn Creek and Right Hand Fork in the Logan River. And, and Joe did a lot of field trips. You know, so Joe, Joe, Joe Wheaton's a professor here at USU. He worked with the state, showed the value, you know, also was a place to, to get rid of nuisance beavers. So you know, that it, it, it looked like, you know, so when people trapped a nuisance beaver, uh, so in, and again, people can correct me if I'm wrong on this. In Oregon, if you're a landowner, you can just remove it. You can just kill a, a nuisance beaver. In this state, you actually have to get someone to come and remove it for you. You can't, as a landowner, in theory, do it. It, it requires a, a request and they come and get it. Uh, and so they have, they have to put them somewhere. And so, this worked out well, both for uh, the Utah Division of Natural Resources, the Forest Service, because it, it is an MIS species on, on, on the Wasatch Cache, a management indicator species. And so this was just mutually aligned uh, goals and objectives that made this work when it came to the closures in this area. But was that enough, Brian? Yeah, no, I would just point out in, in Oregon, um, you know, the closures, I think, were de, weren't explicitly coupled to the restoration actions. In fact, in, in time, I mean, th they were in, what, put in place in the 70s and 80s. Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the modern era of doing the restoration work that we're doing now was initially launched in the mid 90s. And then we've refined how we approach that. So those priority areas that, that I showed in Oregon are somewhat decoupled from any closures per se. They are not decoupled though from interagency coordination and collaboration. Um, as I mentioned, OWEB helps to co-fund a lot of our work and ODF and W works with us on some of the implementation of that work, some of the monitoring and things like that. But I don't know if there's been any closures around, you know, around that, those particular areas um, in, in Oregon, but I may be wrong. But. Hey, thanks for that, um, Brian and Brian and Brett. I'm just going to do a time check. It's 3.30. We've got Jimmy, Becky, and Bob in the queue. And um, I think that we can probably go ahead and get the three of you. I would ask that nobody else put their hand up just yet. You know, we're going to go into small groups. You'll have more conversation. And then we'll do another large group session. So there'll be an opportunity for you to get in the queue um, a little bit later. And so, uh, and I have had in surveys people when we've done the after meeting surveys, several people have pointed out that when I ask people to not get in the queue and other people get in the queue, that makes the people who are not getting in the queue feel like they're they're complying and other people aren't. So um, if we can, if Bob be our last person to speak in this rant, go round, I would appreciate that as would your fellow work group members. So Jimmy, go ahead. Um, please let Commissioner Hatfield Hyde go first. Jamie, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Becky, you wanna go next? I see you figured out where your hand was. So good job on that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um, I, I have Chris to thank for that. It's under the smiley face. Uh, Zoom, I, I hate you, Zoom. Um, uh, I, I just, am, I am, first of all, I love the tone of this meeting. Um, and uh, I, I like that we're starting to get into some good questions and back and forth and, and, uh, and start to crystallize around a few different ideas. But, you know, one of my big takes, takeaways is that when the habitat improves in all of these places, everything benefits. 
right? And and I can see that um, uh, with the, the projects that were highlighted, um, but they are based on, those, those highlight areas are based on a variety of relationships coming together. And so I think, I think I'd like to see um, what that looks like. I'm always struggling um, with the commission because we deal so much with, you know, like regulating harvest when really it's improving these habitats that we really need to focus on. So, and also the other thing that I think, uh, just looking at this, uh, one of the things that Janice Stats from the National Riparian Service Team always used to say is, when she'd come into conversations like this is she'd say, no black eyes, you know, let's move forward. So if you're in ranching or the timber industry or other uh, uh, trappers, people that could be potential partners, if we focused on what we want to see and what we can accomplish or what is wanted, then that gives us an opportunity to be like, oh, this is what you want. Maybe we could get there right? Rather than um, putting people in their corners. So the one thing that I, that does concern me is we've got beautiful examples of active management and we've got thousands of miles of rivers and creeks in the state of Oregon that need help. Um, is there the, the, the um, you know, that gets back to relationship and what we want to accomplish as, as Oregonians. And if you brought, for example, the people in this group together behind visions of what we could do, we could do all kinds of things. If we all stay at one another's throats in Oregon, um, on private land, public land, any kind of land, then I think we lower our opportunity. So that's why I'm just really encouraged by some of the thinking, um, I'm curious about some of the east side, you know, the west side forest issues and, you know, maybe some of what Kyle was saying, you know, maybe there's opportunities if we would um, get a little quieter with each other and hang out. But maybe not, maybe we should fight. All right, go <laughs> quiet. So, so my, my quick answer to some of that is it, it, it is some, it is habitat improvement yeah. But also, it is expansion, and and again, this gets back to what Stan asked earlier: is 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 when you look at NDVI at this broader scale. That's why I had that one picture of this beaver pond. That uh -huh. that 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 one's actually not an area that's managed. It it it, it blinked on. It it may or may not expand. I didn't look. Uh -huh. uh, but a lot of cases, especially in Oregon, unlike necessarily Utah, because we swing gates closed in the winter. And, yeah. And so some of these places in the deep snow are hard to get to and, and meet the 48 or 72 hour turnaround you have to do for checking traps. In Oregon, that's not not as true. A lot of this stuff doesn't get the, the snow depth. And, and so, you know, and again, it's not it, if someone finds a colony and goes and traps it, sometimes they disappear. And, and again, I, I, that's that's a hard thing to figure out. Be, but it, it's doable given NDVI. Uh, I, I just want to be careful. It's it's easy to, to because it's easy to see things when you when you make habitat better their use. That's not the only time beavers show up. It's just harder to quantify that part. So, so yeah, I have one one comment, um, Commissioner Hyde, and it's related to what Commissioner Zarnowitz said, which is, you know, I work I work uh, in the regional office, so the 17th National Forest in Oregon, Washington, and um, I, I just think there's you, know, you get you get the scale effect. The issue you talked about: can we come together in a common framework? I think you can, um, to some level of specificity, at a at a statewide scale, for example. But I do agree that you you a more the a finer scale where you can bring together um, the parties at a meaningful ecological scale, but a um, um, where you where you have less uncertainties around well it could be this or it could be I mean look at look at the diversity of issues we're trying to deal with this across the entire state if you if you bring that down to a smaller scale a basin a sub basin a watershed I think those things can become much more concrete and specific and the players in the room can come to those kinds of agreements that you're that you're talking about so I think that kind of points back to the the comment around that that kind of framework might be the best path for for doing that. Yeah. 
um, and not being at each other through and having those kind of common pathways forward. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, last two comments and then we're going to uh, uh, get into our small groups. So Jimmy. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks to both presenters uh, for your presentations. My question is for Brian. And Brian, this is just a clarification for me. I thought that I heard in you describing the case studies say that um, these were activities that that were um, human caused, uh, anthropogenic activities, your state zeros and, and so forth. Um, and then as a side effect or a benefit, you saw beaver activity in some of these places. D did I hear that correctly? Correct. Okay, so that would be very different than an approach under the concept of beaver related restoration where um, it's assumed that beaver have to be there and take over these places where it's, it's really driven by, you know, uh, putting beaver into an area kind of as a starting point or, or creating more uh, riparian habitat for beaver or, um, or implementing BDAs and things like that with the intent or the expectation that beaver take over these places. I, so I just wanted to, to get that clarification from you. It seems like what you described, you, you feel that those are successful projects or you probably wouldn't have picked them as case studies to talk about today. Um, so I guess just as a follow-up then, do you think that those could be successful um, without beaver. I mean, beaver obviously are, again, they use the places or some of the places, but do you find that they're successful based on what you did and not the beaver? No, I think um, it's not an either or in this situation. I, I think we, um, we are looking to kind of set the table for uh, beavers to come in and kind of finish the, the job and then to maintain that job. So I do view it as this, a form of beaver related restoration. It's just more, much more um, active, uh, you know, the scale of the interventions and the magnitude of them differ um, than, than putting BDAs in. We, we do BDA work, by the way, I totally support that in the right kinds of systems, but you saw the scale of some of those, like the five mile bell, I mean, the, just the level of incision just take too long. So we're trying to jumpstart that process, but no, we don't think that we can be successful without beaver coming in and, and doing that uh, in addition. And in some cases we're doing both where we're doing valley regrading, but then adding BDAs where we're going to be working with Joe Wheaton on some projects in Eastern Oregon this coming year on that. So I, I think it is a form of that, but it's a continuum. It's not a like this is beaver related and that one's not. Um, certainly beaver's role in those different in the systems is very different than in the South Fork, for example, than in the uh, on those east side systems, consistent with what Brett was talking about, where where large wood plays a big role. They govern more the macro scale form and function of the river, rivers and such versus those more um, meadow type systems where beaver really are, exert that first order control. But even in the South Fork, you know, they are accessing those side channels and important and playing an important role in the, in the ecosystem there. They're just not structuring the macro scale, you know, valley scale kind of form and function stuff. So does that help clarify? Um, yeah, I I appreciate that. I just one quick follow up. I know we're short on time, but has there any been any talk about um, if these are actually beaver related restoration projects? What happens if you're successful and beaver do take over these areas, and then beaver populations have increased to a level where they're causing deleterious effects uh, and human wildlife conflicts? Is that part of the discussion for for future planning at large scales? So we've not seen that. And obviously, you know, to, to my knowledge in talking with field, it's not come up. And certainly there are issues with, with uh, conflicts, with, with um, roads and such, but there are management strategies for that. But I, I would argue that our level you know, on the National Forest, I think the level of that kind of issue is much less than on, on private lands, for example, for obvious reasons. And including even in the in the range management arena, where you know, and some of our researchers, Susan Charnley and others, have looked at this from a social perspective. And then, like as you might expect, there's a diversity of views of beaver-related restoration by by ranchers. But it's fairly there's a lot of common ground to be reached there. Some are actively doing it They're in the Sylvie's Ranch work, where they want to do this. They're getting more 
riparian area access with more vigorous vegetation and they can they may have to change some of their grazing strategies and practices but they can work around them so some really want it some are okay with it and some don't but i think there's a fair bit of opportunity for common ground but it does come down to that kind of place-based context of like what's the landscape who are you working with you know again back to the commissioner's points on having a framework where you can have those conversations about how to move forward but i don't view it as being a huge conflict at this point you know okay thank you thanks jimmy all right all right bob you're our last question before we move into small groups just a i guess a quick clarification question from from brent uh, the people monitoring i think you showed um results for oregon and idaho and is, this may be the slide with the red dots is, is that the right one yep okay so what kind of densities of dams did you do you end up with in Oregon? Number of dams per kilometer, number of dams per mile for the Oregon streams. Have you have you analyzed it that way or put it in that kind of number? I haven't played with that very much yet. I think that's where we're going now. I mean, the idea is is just to figure out how often it happens so we have some idea of how often they're showing up and then hopefully trying to figure out why they're showing up. But we're just still starting to do that. So no, we haven't. But if, if I if I if I read your the slide right, it looked like you had very few streams with beaver in the eastern Oregon. Is that that right? is very very true. And again, yeah, you know, those are yeah fairly random. And and again, you know, I, I tried. That's where I'm still working on figuring out why. You would expect more. Okay. okay. Thanks. And I do want to. Yeah, you know, although I you know, sort of push back a little bit on the on the getting things better, I, I do think the commissioner's right. There, there's a lot, lot of win-win solutions here uh, that can push this farther down the the road and, and should make people a, a little bit maybe not perfectly happy. There just seems like there's lots of opportunities here. So, but with that, I don't have to go to the small group. I. I I can, I can leave and let you find those. <laughs> all right. This is true. So if you if we were all together, we would all applause. So if you, there's there's hand clapping emoji, or you can show applause. Thank you to Brent and Brian. Um, Brian, you know, you're he's a part of our group, but yeah, really really great presentation, good conversation, lots of food for thought. Um, so yes, um, Brett, you you can go if you okay. like. Well, well, thanks for being the attentive audience that you were. So, um, so I made some slight adjustments with our time. Um, Sam, can you go ahead and put up the slides that show the, um, the small group instructions? So this, um, and then the other piece is we've got, this is a three hour meeting. And so we do wanna build in just a five minute biological break, you know, so that people can have a good conversation and not be thinking about that they need to drink a water or to do something else. So this is what uh, we're hoping that we can do in our small groups. So there are um, there are seven groups. Um, they're very small. Of uh, just most of the groups are three people. There are two groups with with four people. Um, we actually don't have thirty minutes to brainstorm. I've I've taken it down to um, twenty five. And I'll do a check-in at 20 to see where everybody's at. So we've, I've had to modify that a little bit. So um, this is a brainstorm. There's no debating. I, all ideas are considered. It, the discussion will not be facilitated. It's a conversation with you and the other two people in your group or three people in the group. Um, you, we'd ask that you do select somebody to report out to the large group because we're going to come back. We're going to do a report out. Um, Sam is actually going to do a uh, what's called a jam board, which is a it's a whiteboard that she can start to populate with the outcomes from the small groups in a way that everybody can see. And so when there's um, similar ideas coming up from different groups, we can start to see where there's some groupings. And uh, let's see the meeting guidelines that we've always used in our meetings apply in the breakout rooms as well. So. Um, you know, listening, be respectful, sharing the airtime, all of that. The, the, for those of us in our viewing audience, just like with our other small group breakout, only one group will be live. And that will be the group that I'm in, in the main room. 
And so you can, the viewing audience can get a flavor of the conversation, uh, but when we do a report out, everybody will get to hear what everybody had to say. And then, uh, and as with the previous one, alternates um, can participate as, you know, in the small group conversation. And so if you want to go to the next slide, Sam. So these are the two things that we're, we would like you to do in the small groups. So considering number one, considering the information we've received to date, remember the chart, all the topics and information that we've had, um, share with each other what you what is emerging for you is your top three management approaches or ideas that could be part of recommendations. And remember, this is a brainstorm, it's not a debate. So you know you put you put your top three on the table. Um, you, you can ask questions of each other to better understand what those are. Um, but it isn't at this point, it's about getting stuff out on the table. If there are areas of agreement, that will be great. If multiple people have the same, you know, top one or two, great. Um, make a note of that. But we would like to share, you know, the um, all the ideas uh, with the group that came out of your small group. And we say top three because, you know, it just gets unwieldy if you have a, a huge number of them. And maybe there's only one. Um, how would you like to see the recommendations drafting process? This is the second thing that if you have time, we would be interested in your thoughts on. Um, you know, what is your expectation in terms of level of detail? Is this a small group, large group kind of a um, uh, activity? Would it be helpful for Sam and I to take a run at things before, you know, and bring those forward to the group? Kind of like what we did with the charter, you know, so we've got something to work from, but then we're working on it together as a group. There's lots of ways to go about crafting uh, recommendations. So uh, we'd like you to talk about both of these topics. Number the first one I think is the most important at this point. Um, so if you run out of time, make sure you spend time on that one. And then just for a process within your small group, what I would suggest is that each of you go around and share like share one idea um, and then go around and do it again and then go around and do it again. Um, so that way everybody gets a chance to speak. So that's what we're proposing. Um, you're gonna automatically go into your groups. Um, we would, and then you can just take a couple minutes before you get your group started if you need just to grab a drink of water or go to the bathroom. Um, we'll build in that beginning part of the little break at the beginning of your, um, of your group. So Jefferson asked a question in the chat if we record them. Um, Sam, did, do the small groups have the ability to record the each each breakout group? No, so I would have to make uh, someone a co-host. They'd have to record it. They'd have to send the file. It's a process. If there's sufficient interest in that, we can make that happen. But it is a little cumbersome, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess what I would suggest is that, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a 20 to 25 minute conversation. Somebody in your group needs to take some notes, and then you're going to be responsible to share the hot, you know, share what you what you talked about in your group to the large group, and we do it that way um, for for this one. So, are folks good? Any burning question? People get what we're trying to do here. Not seeing any hands up. Oh, I see one, Ernie. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, just very briefly, uh, would you help me understand the assumption that we should make about how ODFW staff will respond to whatever recommendations we make? I don't have an awful lot of experience with them, but I've heard comments about uh, low expectations. So is one of the recommendations that we focus on getting ODFW to be more responsive or do we assume that ODFW staff will be responsive? Well, respectfully, I would assume that, o that we should assume ODFW staff's best intention and that, um, that they, they would re be responsive and as they're part of this group and listening to what everybody has to say. So I don't know, Kevin, is there anything you want to add to that to give folks confidence? Uh, no, I kind of agree with you, Jamie. Seems like uh, that uh, we're, everybody's participating by the same rules. We're in the same pathway with all the working group members. So uh, 
I wouldn't see our activity and participation any different. That answer your question, Ernie? At least for now, yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I am responding to hearing an awful lot of people express an awful lot of skepticism that has been built up over the years. And, you know, fingers crossed, I hope that, it, you know, that we all can, at the end of this can sing Kumbaya, but um, for the moment, let's assume that, you know, we act in good faith to develop recommendations and ODFW staff will act in good faith to respond to those recommendations. I think that that's a good, I think that that's a good way to, to think about how we're moving forward, Ernie. So best intention. All right, so with that, um, everyone's gonna be automatically assigned to a little group, um, you know, and, uh, and then Sam, will, we will give you a heads up when your time is, uh, when you need to come back to a large group, you'll get a, what? We'll give you a five minute warning and then you get a one minute warning. Um, so, and then do just take a tiny break in the beginning of your group so that people can take care of themselves. All right, Sam. All right, the rooms are open. And if you so don't have a room, there's a few people staying in the main session. So in the main session, we should have Brian, Jill, Shannon, and Wayne, and Jamie, of course. Perfect. And here we are. Hi, everybody. So let's let's um, do take just a couple minute break uh, before we get started. So folks need to grab a drink of water, go to the bathroom. I know I need to fill my water glass. And so we'll just take like two minutes to do that. Okay, and then we'll start. Chris, do you need help getting back to your room? Chris. Hey, sorry. Sometimes when I come and we'll go from Zoom or go into groups, my computer drops um, which audio source I'm using, and it did just okay. that. So now that I rejoined this major meeting with you, it's giving me the correct audio. So maybe try to put me back in breakout five. Okay. And uh, I'm hoping that that it will stick. Otherwise, I might have to cycle this a couple times. So maybe just okay. Or I can I can keep you in the main room, and I'll move someone else to the breakout. Okay, I, I think it'll be fine. It's just it's this weird thing with Zoom that, and I can't. I don't know how to solve it other than I leave and I come back, and then it yeah. seems to work. So yeah, that, and that's that's hard for continued participation. So let's yep. try one more time uh, with room five. One second. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and it, it was an issue that I, it caused me to leave, not just join. And I think that's when it broke the connection. So we'll see mm -hmm. what happens. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. And Sam, can you put the um, um, the the two things that we want people to talk about in the in the chat to yep. everybody, yeah, so that folks yeah. have it available. Hmm. 
So it shows up in the, like a little box. Oh, there it is. All right, we got Jill and Shannon, Brian and Wayne, Just waiting for them to come back. It's always a tough call about taking a break or not taking a break, but on a three hour meeting, it's pretty tough to not, not take some kind of tiny break. So do we, I haven't done a small group <clears throat> before, um, do we just leave our, our um, microphone on? Yeah, yep, I think that's fine. Just leave your camera on and your microphone on, unless you have, you know, barking dogs or a bunch of background noise. <laughs> Wayne and Brian, are you folks back yet? And Shannon, actually, I do think there is some background noise coming from your mic when you turned it on. Yeah, yep. It was me. Are you running a dishwasher? No, it's fully silent in my house. That's funny. <laughs> Sounds like a fan. <laughs> it does, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we don't want you to limit, we don't want that to limit your participation, Shannon, so. Good. I'm, I'm good at running the mute, though. I... Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Wayne. Wayne, do you remember how to unmute? I hope that Wayne remembers how to unmute. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? We'll hope that Wayne can hear. And then um, for Wayne to be able to, un there, there he is. And that, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> you did. You unmuted and your video is off. And, but that's your choice if you want to keep it off or on. If you can remember how to turn the video on. All those good lessons with Sam. Okay, I was trying to do something else there, so. Oh, no worries. You can keep it off. All right, so let's go ahead and get started then. Thank you, um, Jill, Shannon, Brian, and Wayne. And um, Bob, you're not participating, right? You're just here because you need to, there's Wayne. Just to clarify for everybody, Bob is our tech guy from for ODFW, and that's why Bob's name show, is showing up. So the two things for us to talk about, and, um, and I'm not going to be putting anything out there, so it's really just the four of you, um, are, you know, are what are emerging management options um, for the group to consider that could be part of a set of recommendations? And so, you know, I think everybody's probably been thinking about something. And so we just wanted to get those out there and I'll, I'll be the note taker. I'll go ahead and keep track of what those are. Um, and uh, if somebody else wants to be a report out, that would be great. And I can, or I can do the report out, but it's nice for work group members to, to do that. Any volunteers for a reporter? Want me I'm to do it? spell my own name, so. <laughs> I'll go ahead and keep notes and I'll report out. How about that? Make it easy for us. So Jill, I'm gonna start with you and then we'll just, we go here from Shannon, Brian and Wayne. Just, um, just you know, what is one, um, option idea that's you you've been thinking about yeah well i i did express it earlier so i'll just say it again um of viewing the management of beaver um more as on a watershed basis and as need arises or uh, we hear from 
federal agencies that they they are working on a project where they want they would come back um, and maybe maybe they would also be doing other things in the basin such as as we saw in the last presentation by both uh, you Brian and and uh, uh, let's see Brett got to get the right bees <laughs> there um, that you know cattle uh, grazing management that type of thing. Um, it doesn't have to include that, but that ODFW could then do management like they do with fisheries on a more watershed basis or even sub-watershed basis. Um, that'd be new in the wildlife uh, world, except that we do manage elk and deer on management units. So, um, and, and other ungulates actually. But we haven't done it for fur bearers, except when we've, like with the coastal martin, we've, um, the commission decided to close trapping for the population of coastal martin that we knew about. Um, so that's, that's the one idea that I have. And I'm sure that there's lots of other options rather than just doing a blanket closing um, trapping on all federal lands because there's obviously um, interest in trapping as well. Okay, thanks for that. So I've got that one. So um, Shannon, how about you? What is one that's you've been thinking about? Um, so I, I've been thinking about a couple and I think it's the one I'm gonna go with first is I think in alignment with what Jill just said and that is we have a beaver relocation policy that we've developed. Um, and that, that policy is, you know, kind of specific and to an individual beaver level, what you need to consider. But I think we probably should look at that again and talk about where projects are going or where substantial habitat improvement initiatives are taking place and what that means for relocating beaver or not harvesting beaver in those active projects or, or areas. Um, and that could, I'm starting to get into the second one now, that could lead to what's kind of been my frustration all along. If you look at a state that has nine eco regions, and sorry, Wayne, he had to hear this last small group, um, where we have beaver, where we have beaver habitat and where we have public land is very variable in those eco regions. You saw one map in specific where, where they showed beaver habitat and where they showed federal land, they're not in alignment at all, but that's completely different from the coast if you look at Klamath. So I, I kind of like to look at like the good neighbor authority or something like that, where we already are have engagement with our federal partners on habitat projects and, and look at what truly within that area has the potential for um, habitat improvements for beaver. Okay. I'm, I'm writing those down as two things. They kind of are. Just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> Brian? Oh, no, no, I've been occupying a fair bit of time. I'll defer first to Wayne and I, I, I'll go. I got some additional thoughts, but I'd like to hear from Wayne first, please. Okay, Wayne. What are you thinking about? What's a what's a a, num, a a top priority management option the group should consider? Well, uh, this is I don't know how this fits or uh, doesn't fit about an, an option, but I have been <clears throat> listening, and we don't hardly talk at all about underground stuff as it turns to to plants that we should be uh, cultivating and that we should be bringing back that we have totally done away with a lot of our, our plants because of livestock grazing in the past. And a lot of our plants that we have that, that go down uh, deeper and that they go down to where we have different soil types and different soil types carry different amounts of of uh, moisture and that moisture is used during bad times for beaver. And we haven't done very much with that so far, but you know, like uh, 
Well, Carpenter came up with the ideas back in the 40s about how to get water down to deeper places for other, for water storage and for other things than just, uh, you know, having grasses along the sides. But, you know, if I look at some of my list of plants that we have around here, uh, I've got 15 or 20 plants that have been totally uh, just done away with in the eastern part of Oregon. And we're not doing much to get them back. And they are part of this whole beaver complex that we're, we keep talking about and thinking about. But I guess that's my, uh, my, my biggie because, you know, we can have water at, uh, at 40 pounds uh, by weight by just one plant. And in some of those in, in different soil types, but uh, I did I, I did say something about this about three uh, meetings ago, I think, but nobody picked up on it too much, I don't think. But I don't know, maybe I'm kind of off base on this, but we're I think we're missing a, a, a big chance as a and a little bit larger. Uh, look at how beavers are a part of the whole thing because we're missing out on a way that when we have, which we're going into different climate times, uh, but yet we don't seem to be looking at water storage. Does that make so any it, sense? It, well, it does. Let me just make sure I understand. And so when I think about what, um, like Shannon was talking about in her number two um, management option, which was working with state, local, federal partners to identify um, priority areas that have multiple benefits to invest in habitat restoration and, um, you know, for, for beaver populations. What I'm hearing you say, Wayne, is that an important consideration of that, um, identifying that priority area is the, is the, the, the groundwater, you know, and the soil types. You know that that so it's so that's part of what I'm hearing you say that that's a consideration for how you identify areas that you might want to work in. Yeah, we that, it, it, it's it's not just soil types; it's actually having plants that push water down okay. and store it. Okay, and there's a I think whole I, bunch of them: silver sedge and man. Managrass and Kentucky bluegrass, which is not really a very good one, but beak sedge and aquatic sedge and Nebraska sedge, all of those are obligates. Those are plants that I see all the time when I'm walking creeks. And yet I don't see them being a part of what we're trying to do and what I see other people doing for management for, for beavers and stream systems. I mean, it's more than just for beavers. Beavers are a part of that stream system. Mm -hmm. And that's what these plants help us do. Yeah, so, so you're getting to a greater level of detail around vegetation type and soil type, but that those are important considerations and factors when we're, when we're looking at areas that we want to focus investments in. Well, a prime- So Wayne, so Wayne I'm gonna pause you just for I'm going to pause you just for a minute so I can hear from Brian, and then we'll do another uh, round, okay? Okay. Brian? Yeah, I, I hate to be unoriginal, but I've, I've kind of <laughs> made my comments that are very much in agreement with... Uh, Can't hear. You got, Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah. Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I hate to be uh, unoriginal or repeat myself because I already mentioned this, but I, I do agree with um, Councilwoman Sarnowitz on the the place-based approach. I'm not sure necessarily what the exact uh, best geographic scale, you know, uh, would be for that, but I do think a, um, a watershed uh, unit uh, would be a, would be a logical one to do that. Um, and I think that that would allow you to bring together most of the components that you need to, to address at the at the core scale, those kind of core scale filters, um, you know, things like what is beaver habitat suitability. There are tools out there that can help us de define those areas. They're not perfect, as as we've heard, but they're 
pretty good starting point. Um, and some of the issues that Wayne brought in are kind of a more fine scale kind of look at where we have opportunities. But then, so things like that, but then also, you know, it seems that at that scale, we would have a better handle on, you know, what is the population status in, in these areas and, and trends as well as the level of um, mortality via harvest and other, other um, sources of mortality. And if we don't, you know, we can, we can identify that as a key uh, data gap and, and make decisions in face of that and hopefully fill those gaps over time. Um, and, and then we could also, again, look at where, where there's a lot of interest from agencies, including the federal agencies, but also the local and, and state agency interests on, on fish and other aquatic species and such, and where there's a lot of investments being made so that we can you know, honor and support those kinds of investments. And it also is a scale where you could really better understand where some of those um, you know, social kind of either enthusiasm or, or challenges with, with beaver on the landscape are and work through this. So I, I just think that's pretty fundamental, I think, to being successful um, is to set up a framework that where that would be done statewide, but the details of that get done at a, at a finer scale with, mm -hmm. with some and probably additional considerations that I just mentioned. Okay, thanks for that, Brian. So there seems like there's a fair amount of agreement um, on the, um, you know, on the the watershed basis or the management unit approach. You know, I mean, and then everything that comes within that. I mean, so there's the there's the, um, um, you know, gauging agency interest. I mean, the considerations for habitat. I, I just got a little message. Um, so there's there's quite a lot within that. So, but if we had if we had um, these management units sort of across landscapes, then we can we can focus our investments, but we could also learn a lot more in terms of monitoring, um, you know, at a scale that may be replicable in other areas, but at least fill in and fill those data gaps. So that's what I'm hearing so far. Does that sound about right? Yeah. All right, okay, so I'm gonna, so that's um, so so that's one. And then the second, which is sort of a sub piece of that is what Shannon brought up around relooking at the ODFW relocation policy and harvest and how it aligns with areas that we want to build population. That kind of is a, a little bit of a subset of sort of, you know, an agency interest within a management unit. Wouldn't you say, Shannon? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think that's right. Okay, so let's do another round. Are there some other options, other ideas that that are people are kicking around? I think I've expressed <laughs> my main idea, but um, yeah, well, and you really what you've done, Jill, is you've set the sort of the framework, you know, mm -hmm. and then what we've all talked about here are some sort of pieces within that. You know, so if, if we if we go with a management unit approach, there's some considerations and criteria, you know, that we would develop to help us figure out what those are and what would need to happen in those units. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also the, the structure within ODFW that would have to create the system, especially if there's like a limited harvest in a watershed um, or you can, you can harvest down low or up high, but you can't harvest in this one area, depending, you know, we'd have to have some, some uh, respect on or investigation of how that would all work with our um, licensing system and that type of thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's a kind of a more fine detailed element, but it's, uh, we, you know, you can start with the watershed approach and maybe get to an area where you're just closing certain watersheds based on uh, cooperative agreements with the Forest Service or the BLM, but then, um, then look at other approaches, um, such as limited harvest or something like that. I know that the department did, does um, gather you know, or estimate population status based on harvest, but um, they're missing some of the 
elements to really understand what the population is in Oregon and what it's doing. Get, given because they they can't get go out and find you know just do beaver surveys. Right. Yeah. So so the management unit approach would actually help with data gathering to better understand populations as well. Mm -hmm. So um, Shannon, Brian, Wayne, any other ideas before I just hear just a couple thoughts about um, expectations around recommendations, the actual oh. drafting of the recommendations? Wayne? Yeah, I've got, I, I, it's really hard to set in and listen to the, to the speakers that we have had since we started this. I mean, talk about a lot of information about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And, and that has varied a lot between whether you're on the west side or the east side, and it's kind of hard to stick that together. But I mean, boy, I mean, there's a lot of information there and a lot of science. And, and I keep going off the, of the railroad thinking about what are we not getting parts pulled into, which are maybe a little bit smaller than the great big huge parts that go with most of the per, uh, the, the uh, presentation. But one of the things that does bother me is how, how long are we gonna have, uh, well, like, you know, in, in the Crooked River right down here, we had, uh, at one time, we had Great Basin Wild Rye, and we had a lot of it, and we had a lot of beavers tied to that. And right now, the whole entire Crooked River is reed canary grass. I mean, everything was pulled out. They did away with all the other grasses that we had that used to make a big part of the underground water system that would, during bad times, would still have places for beaver. And it still made a difference for that. And you know, all the other stuff, all the other science, just all I can do is just say, way to go. You know, that was really good. <laughs> it and, sounds like they need to pull you in, Wayne, as a consultant on the vegetation types <laughs> in these management units, um, <laughs> that that's an important consideration. Yeah, well, that's where I went. Yeah. So Sam just gave us a five minute warning that the groups are gonna close. This time went by really fast. Brian, go ahead. And then I'd be interested just to hear sort of a lightning round of any thoughts about um, how to put the recommendations together. Brian? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I struggle a little bit with this because um, I know we're focused on federal lands and that's the origins of this. And I know that's the charge here. I wonder though, um, if we have this place-based approach that I think a lot of people agree on, it, it does seem like part of that needs to be understanding of what that population status looks like across all lands and, and, and what the level of relative level of mortality might be in different places. Um, and I speak, I'm a hydrologist, by the way, just for, <laughs> for, for full disclosure, I'm not a biologist, but I am a systems thinker. And I just think you kind of have to understand that and then be using this discrete authorities that different people and agencies have with and how they want to and different programs set up around different kinds of issues but bringing that collective toolbox to the table to to achieve what what we what desires are in that particular basin so i i think we need to stay focused on the federal lands because that's the charge here but i i hope that we can any of the framework does consider that kind of broader um, landscape, uh, physical, biophysical landscape, but also that kind of um, social and regulatory landscape and bring those tools together in an integrated way to, to get towards those outcomes. So how you actually structure that is, um, I mean, saying that is a little easier than actually pulling it off, but I, I think, you know, it needs to be part of the thinking or, or probably should be part of the thinking for this. Yeah, and my takeaway from what you just said, um, Brian, is that, you know, we can be federal land focused, but I mean, we can't do that in a, in a silo. I mean, it has to be in concert with what's happening, you know, across the landscape. And so understanding what's happening in other, you know, in other land management regimes is really important. 
and and the uh, social and regulatory aspect is a big one, obviously for ODFW mm -hmm. because that's we hear all the time from people who have ideas one way or the other, um, and uh, trying to meld that into a productive action is important, and especially when there's regulation involved. Yeah. So I think we're coming up to the end of our time, but are there any thoughts on um, actually pulling the recommendations together? So I, I put out a bunch of some ideas in the large group about, you know, it, we, we have a subgroup that is still willing to continue to work. I mean, they could actually start pulling some things together, um, to, you know, together with Sam and I, Sam and I could. Um, it seems like we need to have some draft of something for the large group to begin to consider um, it, it, as opposed to, you know, full cloth writing in a large group, which is not very efficient. So, but that's my own bias. I, th I think your small group seems like a good option to start with. Um, and did they meet separately without you there or are you facilitating that? Sam and I support them, that we help, okay. we schedule them and then we meet with them, yeah. Okay. Because that and that would be important too to have you folks there definitely. But I, I wasn't involved in the small groups, or I think I actually missed that meeting when they came back and uh, talked about what they had come up with. Um, but uh, I think for me, that's where I'd go at this point. Thanks for that, Brian, Shannon, Wayne. What are your thoughts? Sounded good to me. Yeah, I agree. Finally just going it, someplace. Right. Sorry, sorry, Wayne. Go ahead. I just said that finally we're starting to go someplace. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it seems like that small group approach and an iterative approach where you start, um, you know, with the most uh, general level, get agreement on that, um, and then um, get ideas on some some details to include. Then that team comes back, works <laughs> that, and then comes back for feedback. It seems like that kind of iterative where the small group is working, but coming back on a recurring basis um, to, to get feedback on where they are and ideas on where, where they should go next, you know, kind of mm -hmm. a incremental roadmap uh, and check in with greater yeah. level of specificity as you go. Thanks for that, Brian. Looks like our groups are joining, rejoining us. Welcome back, everybody. Hit the wrong button. Said I had a minute left and I clicked the blue thing to get it out of my way and I came back in. <laughs> okay. We're happy to see you. I did the same thing, Kyle. Sorry. <laughs> Stan. Because we're cavemen, Stan. <laughs> I know what we are. I am, I know. <laughs> Dinosaur. <laughs> Hopefully your small group doesn't think that it's like, what? They just walked out of our small group. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> What's up? Are we all back, Sam? Looks like it. So, um, Sam, is it too is it too adventurous for us to attempt a Jamboard compilation yeah. of the, or are you still on board for that? I'm I'm down to do it. Okay, let's do this then. So, if we were in a room together, this whole exercise would have been done with people writing things on post-it notes and people putting things on a whiteboard and us talking about it and grouping them. And um, anyway, but here we are, we're doing the best we can in this environment. Um, so this is something called the Jamboard. And as um, the small groups report out, Sam's gonna do her best to write them on what the equivalent of a post-it note and uh, put them up here on the, um, on the board so we can start to see areas of uh, where people are saying the same kinds of things. And so um, I will kick off with, I'm, I'm gonna be the report out person for our small group, which was um, Jill and Wayne and Brian and Shannon and myself. And our small group was live streamed to the public. Welcome back um, everybody and to the public for bearing with us here. So we had an overarching, um, an, an overarching uh, recommendation idea that several people 
pulled off of. And that is to, uh, and something that Jill had said in the large group before, which is looking at a management units approach to beaver management at the, at the watershed level. Um, and that there was a lot of agreement in the group about that. And there were some sub pieces around that, which had to do with uh, working with our partners, federal, state, local, NGOs, private as appropriate, um, to identify priority areas and opportunities for habitat restoration and areas that we would like to grow beaver populations. So that's where we could focus our work. And, uh, and that there were subsets of that, we actually, the group started actually kind of building this out, which were that there's some criteria and considerations in identifying those um, management units, one of which would be, like I said, uh, agency and other partner priorities, one of which would be, you know, looking at the plant types and soil types um, in those areas and the ability for beaver uh, <laughs> increase beaver populations to improve those. Um, there would be opportunities for focused monitoring. Uh, we could learn quite a bit more about beaver populations and better data gathering. And, um, and there were some questions about, you know, what this means for the regulatory environment and the license environment. There's some work that we would have to do internally with ODFW in order to make this happen. Um, it was also brought up that we need to understand population dynamics across land management types that we can't do our work in a silo. And so that I'll pause there on the, those are the ideas that came up around management options. And then for recommendation development, um, we talked about that this small group is a good place to start. They liked the subgroup continuing to work and to develop um, something for the larger group to consider. And then we would do an incremental discussion about those. So that's our report out. Did I get it all, group, in a thumbnail? Brian, Jill, Wayne, Shannon, thumbs up? Good, yeah. Yeah, that sounded like what we talked about. OK. Yep, I agree. All right, what group would like to go next? I don't know what group number I, I was, actually, Sam. What group number was I? Sorry, I had to get off mute. You were zero. You are oh, <laughs> group number zero. All right, well, let's hear from group number one. And again, it's just like a minute or two recap. Do you know who group number one is? Can you tell us? That would be Jefferson, Ernie, and Sam. Okay. I was afraid of that. Um, so, uh, Ernie and Sam and I talked uh, uh, briefly about our, uh, the recommendations that we had, uh, the, the question number one, in terms of what we, we thought would, should be brought forth. And um, that uh, we talked about uh, ODF and W being able to uh, make habitat management recommendations and um, collaborate with land managers. Um, there are the presentations where they discussed the ability to do that and there's a lot of precedent for that. Um, and uh, to, to follow that up with re restoration funding like through the Oregon Conservation Fund or landowner, uh, uh, this isn't on, uh, private land, but um, there are already funding streams that do that. They actually are funding some of my beaver restoration work right now. Um, uh, the idea of beaver harvest reporting changes so we could get better ideas uh, on um, exact locations, exact locations where uh, beaver are being uh, trapped um, rather than just a county. Um, and um, then um, better public guidance and uh, opportunities for non-lethal beaver management options. So just making that more of a, a clear recommendation. So let's see, we had three apiece. So um, we did talk about uh, a trapping closure for a, a, a set period of time on, on federally managed public lands, but definitely uh, the idea of 
looking at um, within that uh, tracking things. Any any closure or any changing to trapping regulations are going to be really important to a company with um, the monitoring and measuring that can be used to gauge the efficacy. And that's really been a complaint for a long time, both sides that actions have been taken in the past and sometimes not accompanied by data gathering. Um, and so uh, really to have that clear um, that that would be kind of a, a requirement of that. Um, and that could guide the uh, improvement of management uh, actions in the, in the future. Um, and then um, that uh, it'd be useful to have uh, Oregon uh, designate the um, beaver differently under the Oregon conservation strategy, um, and have it designated as strategy species. Um, that's something that's within ODF and W's purview and kind of brings it more into the fore and, and relating uh, the, the priority that, that um, the beaver working group has said that beaver are and it'll, it'll help bring that to the fore of conversations. Um, but then also there's the, the idea of um, kind of collaborating and, and educational outreach that would be really useful on, on this in terms of collaborating with other groups that can help out um, but also the, the public sharing of data as someone who it's uh, really been trying very hard to educate myself and gather data that that exists uh, that ODF and W has or, or that's uh, been taken um, that it's really hard to get that data. And so it would be great to have a little more transparency there. Um, but in terms of uh, educational um, opportunities, um, maybe in a second, Sam can just follow up on that. Um, because the, the other access, the other uh, question was number two, and um, that's the process and level of detail and, and who. And I, I, I think we were really coming down on wanting Jamie and Sam to work on um, kind of aggregating the, um, the information that has been presented by the Beaver Working Group members uh, in the in the meetings so far, aggregating that um, into a into a final document, um, and just recognizing the difficulty that it that there is to have um, a committee write something, uh, and so having them them do that, but really focusing on there's going to be times when recommendations meet head to head, and using as an adjudicator to decide those things. The, the policies and, and mandates that the ODF and W has to follow, which are the climate policy, their mission statement, and the Oregon conservation strategy um, as really guiding um, principles and the, and the policies contained we're in. But Sam had some neat ideas on education that I think should be better talking about than, than just me. And actually what I'd like to do, Sam, sorry about this, is if we can move on to hear from another group, and then if we have time, we can circle back to Sam to provide any more detail, because we've got um, six other groups to hear from. Sure, Jamie, they're fun, lighthearted, and I would love to share them at the end. Okay, great. So group number two. I think that was us. Uh, Danielle, uh, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, and Stan. Um, so the things that we listed off, let's see, um, wide scale reporting of harvests to, to improve when and where and how um, in the harvest report card it would be um, by watershed. So similarly to get to a place where we have a better understanding of um, and more specific information about that and eventually potentially with that then getting to a place where we could restrict harvest. Um, changing beavers predatory uh, status classification um, from predatory to fur bear, which I think applies just to private land but still perhaps could be in the recommendations to the legislature and the suite of things. Um, Updating, I guess another person said updating the harvest reporting card again, just trying to get that, that data collection based on watersheds and just having a better understanding. Um, 
Again, also updating the Oregon conservation strategy, both to include beaver as a strategy species, um, but also even in the strategy habitats, just making sure that these things are all connected because um, as we are aware, the Oregon conservation strategy really drives the framework for ODFW's conservation work. Um, and also it you know, often informs where funding should be um, put. So just really wanting to make sure when that update happens that this is included. Um, uh, another mention was also for a hunting trapping closure on federally managed public lands. Um, and then finally, we had um, just, again, this sort of chicken and egg challenge of how do we think about furthering landscape restoration so that we have better habitats so that beaver, beavers are able to thrive. So what are the specific practices to get to a place where then beaver are just able to thrive in current conditions or I guess future conditions? Um, wanting a study that shows an area with trapping and an area without. So I think just getting at, again, research and monitoring and trying to collect more information. Um, and then also wanting to include an educational component for public outreach and engagement and, and just community, um, yeah, community engagement. Thank you for that, Danielle. Looks like Sam's got caught up. All right, so let's see, that was group two. Zero, one, two, group number three then. Let's hear from you. Sam, if you can remind us who they are or maybe you know who you are. I think that might have been the group I was in with Bob and Kyle. Yeah, okay. Um, so we came up with a number of different ideas and um, let's see, the, we, didn't, we didn't all agree. We didn't really debate these except maybe just a tiny little. Um, but uh, so the first one was around limiting trapping. Um, either a couple of different ideas were discussed there around closure on all federal lands. Um, and another idea around limitation was having catch limits. So reduce, just have a, essentially like bag limits on the fish side of things. Um, so that was one idea. The second idea was around conducting some more controlled uh, research to really get at whether or not um, trapping was, was limiting things. So you, you have a, a closed area and an area that's not closed, um, no other things changing. Uh, look at that. Also probably have an area where you're doing some sort of um, riparian or stream restoration type activity and where you're not and just kind of look at those factors independently. That was the second one. The third one was around uh, beaver supplementation where, where beaver could be live trapped on private property or a place where they're not wanted and moved over to a place where they are with, with ODFW and federal land managers kind of partnering to decide where those beaver would go. Um, that was the 1-800-come-get-my-beaver idea. Then um, those were the top three. Uh, we didn't. We thought we were limited to three. I'll, I'll say the other two that, that came out that didn't really, um, we weren't going to bring forward, but it sounds like we're bringing more than three forward. One was around thinking about riparian management practices, um, not necessarily seeing, trying to figure out where um, we might move away from the riparian protection for large wood and temperature uh, that may be actually be moving away from habitat that, that beaver can utilize for these, these um, uh, wetlands that they can create. And then the last one that came up was trying to get ODFW to recognize beaver as a key keystone species uh, that needs protection. And then um, in terms of groups, the, the discussion and how to move forward, um, sorry, the process moving forward, we thought, uh, talked about having um, the, the group make recommendations, uh, then having them uh, written up uh, and vetted through ODFW for feasibility and then brought back to the group for review. Um, there was also, the thought about needing to have some sort of process for the whole group to get agreement on these different recommendations and if science plays a role or what exactly that process and lining out exactly how you're going to get to 
um, agreement on, on the recommendations. And that was it. Great, thank you, Tom. All right, group number four. Do you know who you are or do we need to remind you? I think that was, was me and Kevin and uh, Brian Poslitz. Okay. Um, so we, we came up with each of our top three. <laughs> so it makes, it, it seems like perhaps we were a little overreaching. So, um, uh, and you guys jump in if I quantify this um, incorrectly, but I feel like all three of us had the same starting recommendation to some degree, um, kind of some, some through lines. So I'll try to, to coalesce that into one for you guys. Um, so Brian led off with uh, that ODFW um, should prioritize funding of beaver habitat uh, on federally managed lands. Um, and then Kevin spoke about outlining uh, collab collaborative projects uh, that would increase uh, beaver habitat. Um, and I threw in there exploring MOU options to create beaver habitat improvement. So we have a, a through line in all of our first uh, topics there of uh, finding ways to work collaboratively um, across the agencies uh, to increase beaver habitat. Um, we also threw in there um, the, the second or follow on piece of that would be um, seeking some funding options um, like the OCRF um, and, and grants like that, uh, that would therefore help us do those collaborative projects. Um, and this one's a little bit different and I, I'm gonna hold it on its own because I thought Kevin had a really cool idea here when he said um, to strategically prioritize uh, where we do the beaver habitat work. We need to find a strategic approach to identify um, how those uh, areas are prioritized and how that needs to be approached. Um, I'll wait for just a second because I realized I was just reeling these off and was not giving Sam time to write, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, we did have a suggestion for um, uh, recognizing or changing the uh, beavers um, uh, designation as a strategy to a strategy species uh, so that it was included in the conservation uh, strategy planning. Um, we had uh, a suggestion of the closure of hunting and trapping of beaver on federally managed lands. Um, we also had a, uh, similar to what other groups have come up with, um, evaluating past closures for effectiveness um, and then trying to see ways um, that those may be used more effectively in the future. Uh, so similar to what other folks have said, like a control uh, type study uh, or, or a scale of closures. And then the last one was um, to, to adjust some of the, reg the trapping regulations um, to allow for data collection. Um, of the animals that have been trapped so that um, that can be an assistance to ODFW um, in their data collection for population health and, and any of the other measures that we may want to be able to um, evaluate based on um, DNA and data collection from the trapped animals. And so that was our um, recommendations or management approaches. And then as far as the process for drafting recommendations, um, uh, we felt like there was a suggestion for C Jamie and Sam to kind of coalesce or collate this list of suggestions and recommendations, um, obviously for the group. Um, we felt like these small group conversations are actually um, really, uh, useful. It was really um, great to just have three faces, you know, to talk to instead of the 30 of the, the usual screen. Um, and so we felt like the small group conversations um, were, were useful um, in crafting this, but the full group participation is going to be needed to get to the full recommendations. Um, we had a, a really good conversation around the fact that we're all going to need to have um, you know, the hard conversations, I think, as a full group um, to make sure that everybody feels heard um, and that we, we are just gonna have to get to some of the perhaps more controversial topics. Um, and, and that probably should be done in the large group setting. Um, and we just need to set aside enough time to, to do that. 
um, and have those those big conversations. Um, and and I just feel like there's there needs to be a lot of transparency in how we're um, putting the recommendations together. Um, and that again, the large group um, has full buy in on on that or not. I don't want to say buy in, but participation, I guess, um, in, in that. So that's what we came up with. Um, Kevin and Brian, if you've got anything that I didn't capture, please jump in. The only thing I was going to add, Amy, and maybe it's for the other groups too, it, it'd be good for uh, the note takers to send the full notes. Like I, I think Amy took great notes, uh, but like I said, we, we got ambitious. We each gave three ideas. So I think in, that, that's helpful just to get the full story. Yeah. Yeah. So any note takers, if you want to just email those to Sam and I, um, we'll just have the full, the, we, we can include that in the, um, in the meeting summary. Okay, so group number five is Chris and Darren and Matt and uh, Commissioner Woolley. Okay. Um, so we we all gave our top four, but it turns out we all gave the same top four. And so I'm going to present them as the four, but with the slight variations that came from, from our conversations. Um, so, uh, recommendation the first around translocation or moving um, so work with federal agencies to increase translocation efforts of you know, nuisance problem animals onto um, federally managed public lands into areas of high uh, suitability and going along with this there's some support necessary that is distributed network of translocate of translocation support facilities holding facilities um, so that's been shown to be good for screening for diseases and for pair bonding and those in that kind of uh, effort um, as well as expanding the need for awareness and access to coexistence structures either as an alternative to the trapping and hauling or as as this process is successful there will be more interaction with Beaver on uh, and uh, on private property and how to um, offer alternate non-lethal solution alternatives. So that's translocation. Um, closures, um, hunting trapping closures associated with the translocation efforts. So that's good return on investment. It's good PR. If there's a bunch of investment in, in translocation, then it shouldn't be um, lost if there is a uh, harvest uh, um, in those areas. Um, focus hunting trapping closures on key land federal land types so blm's late ser late cereal reserves wild and scenic river areas uh, other areas of ecological concern um, and then design those hunt trap closure areas at the appropriate ecosystem scale so they're sufficiently large in watershed contiguous nature and for a long enough time, multiple generations, so that we can detect a response in the amount of beaver modified floodplain. Um, both of those two things depend on number three, which is potential habitat quantification. So a map, statewide beaver habitat potential, and this is the potential for modifying floodplains, like fish intrinsic potential maps that, that um, multiple state agencies used to identify high intrinsic potential for, for coho or steelhead, similarly for, for beaver modified floodplain areas. Um, and make this simple, break it into low and high. And the high areas are where you focus and low areas are where you don't, um, at least at first, as Brett talked about, but also think about the landscape connectedness. So if there are high potential areas, but they are fragmented, then maybe they are of less value because they aren't near other high areas. So a landscape perspective. And the last, whose job is all this? And that's the statewide beaver coordinator position. So a dedicated coordinated coordinator, probably best rostered in ODFNW, key to develop these relationships with federal um, uh, and, and, and other state agency partners. Um, so maybe a role for the new habitat division or somebody in the habitat division. Um, and that potentially has the task of 
of integrating beaver management questions with other state agencies. So this is not just in front of ODF and W. Um, how those recommendations will be coordinated and presented to the commission. I'm pausing for Sam to type. Um, too many cooks will certainly be an issue. So a small group to develop, do core writing, probably the, the existing core small group could work, subgroup, but bring in expertise, bring in ODFNW or bring in federal land um, uh, managers to have offer opinions on particular components that with the, in, with the large group, so it's not done in isolation. Uh, more meetings is not a good idea, but probably need to be working into January. And that ultimately the final product will be um, handed to Samantha and Jamie to finish off um, as part of their as responsibilities. But we were also unclear at the level of detail that was necessary. So what does the final product actually look like? Is it guidelines or is it actually a whole list of recommendations that are immediately actionable? All right, Matt. And Darren, did I miss anything? Hey, thanks, Chris. Last group is um, Scott and Derek and Jimmy. Okay. Um, I'll start out by saying that Scott had to leave early. Um, but one of the things that he left us with, which I'd like to carry forward, is that he wanted us to make sure that we understand the potential ecosystem impacts before we recommend or implement any actions. And then um, he had to leave. And then the rest of the conversation was between Derek and I. And we wanna recommend that moving forward that uh, the group consider working within the current regulations that we have. And several of the comments that I've seen come from the groups before definitely fit into that. There are things that can be uh, recommended to the staff to increase uh, the number of research studies or uh, do experimental closures and monitor the efficacy of those and things like that can all be done without any new rulemaking processes. Uh, we wanna encourage people to think about that. We also um, recommend taking a holistic approach in moving forward, um, not just being focus strictly on beaver, but, and this goes back to some of the earlier comments, um, and this has kind of been my mantra for a while, is that we need to focus on managing watersheds that include beaver and not managing single species like beaver. Um, you know, just as a note, we also mentioned that, um, you know, we don't want to, rec excuse me, we don't want to repeat mistakes from the past and as it's been brought up several times in the meetings before, we have ex uh, these um, trapping bans that have happened on national forests, national or public lands, let's call it, um, that have been in place for a number of years and we can't really say if it worked or not. So um, any actions that we recommend, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring those for effectiveness. Um, and to remember, you know, that our focus is on public lands. I mean, that everyone knows that, but it's worth restating again, I guess. Um, so it's pretty short and sweet. Did I miss anything, Derek? Uh, <clears throat> one little kind of concept of an emphasis of, of establishing a baseline, uh, based on understanding of all sorts of things that are knowledge gaps that we we don't know where beaver are or are not, if we don't know what beaver abundance is, if we don't know uh, other relationships, it makes it very, very difficult for us to talk about treatments or to talk about certain management actions without having a better understanding of uh, what the current baseline is or what the current relationship is. Thank you. Yeah, and that's just kind of fleshing out the, the concept of taking a holistic approach. And again, what Scott said is, before making any recommendations to affect change, let's understand what those potential impacts are. That's it. 
everything in the system. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Derek and Scott. So, um, so as you can see, now we have these two whiteboards populated with a, a wide range of things. So what's gonna happen next is, and I heard this in a number of groups comments, um, is that uh, you know, Sam and I will work to synthesize this to the best that we can. Um, and uh, the subgroup has expressed interest to continue to meet. And so I would expect that we would schedule a time with the subgroup, bring a synthesized something um, to the subgroup, talk that through, and then make a, bring something forward to the large group um, for large group conversation and potentially some small group work um, to try to move this forward. So that's our next meeting is three weeks from now on November 17th. Um, the one piece that we didn't get to talk to and we're just about up at time are, is other, are other information needs that the group has in order to uh, refine recommendations. And that might become more apparent when you when when you look at this in its totality and start to see where it's going, that we might need to have um, some deeper conversation around some areas to to tease out or further refine recommendations, um, and so be thinking about that. I mean, when when you know you've all heard this conversation we had today, if there are things that have come up for you, like um, you know Stan mentioned earlier and about, it's like, hey, you know, I'd like to have a more conversation about some of the other limiting factors and what are some things that we can be doing more of, less of, or differently there. If there are other information items like that that have come up for you through the conversation we've had today, just send Sam and I an email and we'll um, capture those. You can also put them in the meeting, um, the meeting survey that we do after each meeting. You can add it there about things to consider. So, uh, so with that, we've got we've got one minute before before the end. I was going to put the um, work plan back up on the screen, um, and we can do that real quick just to remind everybody sort of what is happening next. Sam, if you can, I know she's working on that. Get that up. So, like I mentioned, our next meeting of this group is uh, three weeks from now. A um, couple of things you'll be seeing from us is the usual immediate action items as a result of this of this meeting. The um, it'll include the sur uh, survey that's very helpful for us about your, in your input about how the meeting went, um, and then you also get a, a, a scheduling doodle poll for these meetings in January and February, so we can get those on our calendar. So that's some immediate things that you'll be seeing, and then of course the meeting summary next week. Um, and then Sam and I have already blocked out a big chunk of time tomorrow to work through the information that we had hoped we would get on the whiteboards today, which we did. And so we appreciate everybody taking time um, in the small group and participating in that. So I'm gonna pause and just see if there are any um, final comments or questions before I close our meeting out. Yes, Jefferson just asked about subgroup meeting scheduling. So that will be, you'll look for a follow-up email from Sam on that. Any other thoughts or reflections, questions for the good of the order before we close our meeting out today? No. Not seeing anybody jumping in. Amy? Yeah, I just, um want to say that I appreciate the the tone of the meeting today um, and that uh, you know I think that as we move forward we're going we, we will probably have to have some hard conversations that we're not all going to agree on but I'm a little um, uh, I don't know I don't know the right word I feel a little bit better about it I guess after this this meeting and the fact that you know we've um, had the opportunity to have some of these small group conversations. I think that helps a little bit um, to talk in those settings um, and then also paves the way for us to have the bigger conversations in the big group and still remain respectful while, um, you know, expressing our, what can be very different opinions. Yeah, thanks for that, Amy. Any other thoughts before I officially close us out? 
Thumbs up from Jefferson. Thumbs up from Jill. All right. <laughs> Chris says more meetings. Uh, Kyle says uh, the volume of middle ground identified is encouraging. And again, I read out the chat for the benefit of our viewers because they can't see the chat. All right, everyone. It's a, it's a two minutes after five. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, everyone. It was a great meeting. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you all in November. Bye-bye. Thank you.